Welcome to Meet the Voter, episode 06. Here's where we discuss the issues of the week and we, after watching Meet the Press. Today I have Jonathan Denwood. We all know Jonathan. He's our social Democrat. I probably said that close enough, social Christian Democrat. Um, yeah. origin. You know, he's, he's an American citizen, but he still has deep roots into his country of origin that he still loves. Uh, I, I would have pointed out, Bill, that I'm also a, I'm a joint citizen. Yep. Of, of My Britain. nephew was too for a long time, He until he... Uh, you know, sign up for the Marine Corps. <laughs> it's a long story. When Trump, when Trump gets into power, can run across the border to Canada. Yeah. Oh, can you go to Canada? Okay, we'll have to talk about that some other day. And then uh, Sam Brooks coming to us from Long Beach. Sam is very active in is an intern in the LA County Democratic Party. How's the Democratic Party doing down there this week? Great, great. We just had the Democrats of the Year awards uh, yeah. two weeks ago, so. Lots to talk about that in the last session. So what I find is, as Sam uh, usually is off to the left in my book, I'm off to the right. Jonathan is everywhere. <laughs> I know Jonathan. He's got a little libertarian in him. He doesn't know it. And his oh, social. I, there is, um, I don't like people stereotyping me. They love doing it. We it's all do. do. We all do. But I just like messing with people's yeah. brains. Yeah. Well, I know how you believe uh, your social. Uh, your opinion of government should make sure that everyone has a job is unique. I, is really, I think that's what Roosevelt was about, wasn't it? Yeah. Anyway, so let's talk a little bit about Meet the Press. I'm going to make a quick statement. I thought Meet the Press was very unbalanced today. Uh, they didn't have any representation from the Republican Party. Some of the things that they said, um, I like Lee and Panetta generally. He was okay. But everybody else I thought was sort of Republican bashing. And they weren't challenging some questions. I can't, Sam, you got his name. I didn't get his name. I, I think I started scribbling it down, getting it correct. Yeah, Aslan. Aslan. Um, they didn't challenge what he said about the Southwest Airlines. So what I did at meetthevoter.com, if you go to Meet the Voter, under primary sources, you'll find a secondary source. It's the LA Times article about why Southwest threw them off and that they're actually being charged in federal, federal court. So that's up there if you want to read that. But that's a secondary source because we don't have any video or uh, maybe eyewitness quotes. It's very difficult. You have primary, secondary. The other thing too, as I put up, is that President Obama in 2014, uh, around September 11th, had a press conference and he said that ISIS was not a state and that the members in ISIS were not Muslim. So that's clearly where the president is coming from. That's the first. Well, can I ask for some clarification on um, your issue with uh, saying ISIS isn't a state? Because yeah. I understand from what I've understood, the whole point of using this different terminology to refer to them um, as like da dash. Is that what the French call Diash, them? Yeah, yeah. Now, what I wasn't familiar with Diash again. So the idea I'm, is that um, different governments, especially like, for example, um, Obama, as well as uh, France, don't want to acknowledge that ISIS is a sovereign nation state. The idea being that they are not a sovereign nation sa state. They have simply taken control you know, illegally of lands that aren't theirs. So it's actually kind of against them that they try to make that distinction. Like you can't just take over a territory and call it a country and we're going to acknowledge that, you know. But I, I think that's a good point. That's a really good point today. Now, I go back in the 10 years that I was studying the issues around the people we were fighting for the 10 years I was involved. They were basically rogue areas and territories. Afghanistan was definitely a rogue state um, under, led under the Taliban. And the reason why we invaded Afghanistan is because they would not turn over Osama bin Laden and we're still protecting him. So mm -hmm. after Osama killed you know, 3,000 Americans, we consider that an act of war from the state of Afghanistan. And we went in and very short, in very short term, we uh, invaded and took over within a few months and tries yeah. to stabilize it. But then the Taliban mostly ran over into Pakistan and reorganized. And then would come back in the spring and they always had these puppet governments set up behind each provincial government area. So that's what I was mm -hmm. fighting, what I was dealing with, and then trying to figure out to get what was going on in the minds of the Afghans. That was my specialty. Yeah. So can you, like, am, I, am I not seeing it from a different perspective as well? Or um, do you understand why different leaders wouldn't want to give them that um, credibility in terms you know, of referring to them as a sovereign nation state and giving them, therefore, the, uh, different sets of rights? internationally yeah you know? i i don't think as a rogue state i don't think that's I, they're not recognized i'm sure by anyone in the world so they're not a recognized state i forgot which countries you know certain countries aren't recognized yet today yeah 
Um, I can't. I don't. It I'm not an expert. The in that rules area. of the game, if they are, if if ISIS were to be recognized as a sovereign nation state, then it would be the, kind of a different situation. The, the Taliban, I don't remember now, but there are only two nations that represent uh, that recognized Afghanistan and the Taliban as a legitimate state. I the forgot they're as a state. How so? Uh, in Afghanistan, they were recognized by two countries. I can't remember exactly. I hate to say who they are. I could Google it to verify it. Because I, I think I know who they are, but I don't want to say and be wrong right now. Because there's only two, I remember only two two countries that. What did you? Th um, what about the when you're talking about there not being a lot of Republican leaders? What did you think about the? Um, well, they had John Kasich administration's on, military leader. What was his name? They had John Kasich on. No, no, um, the general from the, the Bush administration who was. I, I must about have missed that in and out. I I thought I caught it all. Was there a general on? Do anybody remember who the general is? Yeah, I didn't catch it. I didn't see the general on for him. Yeah, I feel like Meet the Press is often, I mean, if it's not slanted in one direction or the other, it seems to kind of give this uh, really manufactured series of perspectives that isn't maybe legitimate from either direction. I mean, I felt uh, like last week I was pretty like stunned by their straw poll of people who were like, were like, hey, do you support Hillary Clinton? And they all raised their hand in the room. And then oh, yeah, I saw that. When they um, they were talking about um, Bernie Sanders' question to Hillary Clinton, but they didn't show Bernie talking at all. They just showed her very dramatically. You know, I don't know. It's interesting. The other thing, too, is they bar barely talked about the campaigns uh, this week, about what's mm -hmm. going on in the campaigns. They didn't talk about the candidates. And I, I pretty, that's what I really want to find out. do that, do you? You have to start discussing policy. You can't have that, can you? I, I know that Hillary Clinton is supposed to be coming to Reno. Oh, I can throw something out of the witch. Jonathan. Jonathan. I'm trying to be semi-civil, but what I can say, here's a true fact. I tried to go see her last time she was here because they're having a veterans rally for her. You got, mu you got that much of your life to waste. Bill. Yeah. Well, no, that's what I want to report on that. I go and try to, when a candidate's in town, I try to listen and watch so I get firsthand inference. I think her, they, I think her, they her did husband not allow me her much too much from both of them over the years. That, that was so controlled in such a small area. I wasn't allowed in with, it wasn't a veterans event. It was about half of the local party who supported Hillary and the veterans who supported Hillary. It wasn't an open event. I rather vote the right Trump to do that. than that witch. What's that? And then Trump's event, Trump had an event here this month over at the Nugget, and it sold out. Now, I think it only had 1,500 people, but it sold out well ahead of time. But Hillary's was very small. I say under two or 300 people. Well, they've got, to keep, they've got to keep it small because she wouldn't get more than 100 people in Reno. Yeah. I went to Bernie Sanders' rally here when they had 4,500 people with my sister. And that was an ec excellent rally. I can only say that was the best managed rally I've ever seen. It was open to all and it was a common area. And I thought that was a really good rally. It was well. I mean, I, I look at how well they're put together, too. So, anyway, those are some of the things that meet the press. Any, any last thoughts? We'll take a two minute break about meet the press and their start today. Um. Well, Sorry, a just was really boring. Didn't discuss anything of any relevance. Was got a load of phobies on that were saying what the system wants to be said. Doesn't really affect normal working Americans. No real insight. No nothing really. When we come back, I'd like to talk about the next ten minutes. Is are the candidates representing the people? Well, that's not their purpose, really, is it? So we are back, and what we're going to talk about in this part of the episode is Jonathan became a U.S. citizen, and Sam Brooks went and had a visa and was in France for five years, which I think is probably tough to do, I'm guessing, to get that stay that long in, in France. But Jonathan, tell us about your visa process. What was it like becoming a U.S. citizen? Um, it was typically, um, it was okay, but it was typically kind of bureaucratic, which it's bound to be. Um, um, homeland, home, homeland security people are terrible, but they're not. Didn't laugh. They didn't laugh too much at my jokes. So, uh, how um, did you fill out the communist question? I didn't tick it because I'm a socialist. I'm not a communist. Um, 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 that question's still there. Um, you you have to give them like six hundred and eighty dollars. They weren't very flex. Um, uh, you get a booklet with a hundred questions. Some of them are, um, if you couldn't answer some of the questions, you would need to be brain dead. <laughs> some of the other questions are quite detailed. 
um i kind of hit wikipedia hard and learn everything like you do to pass these brain dead exams by rope what what they prove i have no idea what um learning the american constitution how that denotes how you're going to be an effective member of of american society i do not know um then you um you go for an interview they ask you uh, six or ten questions i think they ask you ten questions and if you've, you've got to get six of them right not those off straight off and then uh, i suffer from dyslexia so i was worried about me my handwriting's like a doctor now so i just write everything on a computer so my handwriting's are atrocious it's got even worse than all because i don't hardly write um apart from typing so she asked me to write this sentence for for god's but it was a very simple sentence so that was knocked off and then we had a little chat um which was a chat but i could i could tell that it was done in a way to it was an interrogation but it was a friendly chat and then she said well you're you're in mate you know um um i had asked them to um do the um because i was over in the i was planning to go back to the uk for a little while i know this sounds strange but this is how it was working out and um i wanted to get my citizenship because if you leave for any kind of extended period of time on a green card homeland security have the right to um to challenge your entry and then you have to go into the immigration court system and that's a nightmare so um i was trying to get my citizenship so i wouldn't have to have one of those awful conversations with homeland security um so i asked them if i passed the test could i have the swearing in ceremony the same day and yeah. um they they have got the right the uh, manager of the center has the right but she had um my bad luck she had gone on vacation and she wasn't available so i had to come back from the uk to do my swearing in um basically the whole system is a joke it's totally broken um the canadian system is much more intense um it's bureaucratic as well but um they want to know about your qualifications about here it's just based because i i had managed to live here for five years I and you're been, married too i'd been married but it was the five year because yeah. i've got if i've been still married it was three years but mm -hmm. i i've been here for five and i just recently got divorced and i thought i might as well go for it so it's time based they don't really ask about they don't really spend enough time to find out um, a lot of systems are just based on your qualifications and i really don't agree with that either what what, what year was that that you became a citizen was 2006 or 7 i forgot you told no, me no no it was much um it was 2013 oh 13 yeah really that's no that's soon yeah it's about it was, well, it was the it was the end of 2012 or the end wow. of, yeah 2012 to i think so was, did they ask you any questions on religion no and but all I saw on the form was they asked for secondary information, like on birth certificates, uh, which they said was related uh, from a church. Their or, basic position build um, is certificates. what the diff. They, they're, they're, where it gets really difficult to enter America is getting a green card. Mm -hmm. um, that's where the nightmare. That's where all this nonsense is really bad and i entered as a um i entered and i was married but i still had to apply for a green card and um i had to do an appeal in london because my initial um officer that interviewed me was having a rough day and she refused me entry and i had to go back and um oh. appeal and i saw a senior officer at grosvenor square um and he liked me <laughs> and, and he stamped me and I, my wife at the time didn't think i was gonna get because being married to an american citizen does not give you the right to right. enter america so it was a it looked like we had a bit of a problem but luckily the second officer um looked at my background my qualifications my business experience blah 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 and he did um 
he determined that I was a suitable candidate to enter America. Now, one last question. We're going to, to Sam. Did you, where did you go to initially talk to the officer here in the States? You lived in Reno at the time. Which part are you talking about? The when you first card? did your interview and application, where do you have to go here from Reno? For to become a citizen? Yep. Uh, that's in Reno. They've got a Homeland Security office in Reno. So you Is did that, it right here in Reno. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's um, the whole the whole thing, Homeland Security. You couldn't choose a more um, George Orwell 1984 yep. title, could you? <laughs> After after Sam talks about going the other direction and getting a visa to be to France, I'm going to talk sh briefly about my experience in Afghanistan with the State Department and getting some Afghans out of the country and how difficult it was. I'll bet it was. I'll bet it was. Sam, go ahead. How, what, now, getting a visa going the other direction in France, what was that like? You were there for five years. It's a long time. Could you become a citizen? Um, well, I mean, I think that's the interesting thing about this discussion is like, um, like they were talking about on um, the show. Sam, I'm going to ask you to speak up a little bit or increase your gain. Yeah. Is okay, this no, better? That's better. Yeah. Um, so what's interesting is like France, first of all, especially because I'm coming from the United States, it's and and also if you're going the route of trying to be a student, then in most countries that is that's that's extremely simple as long as you're enrolled in some kind of educational program in that country. And I've heard that from all of my French friends who've come here that the same is true for anyone coming into the United States. I think what's interesting about the topic is that, you know, we can talk about what's the formal process of trying to enter a country. But, you know, like the visa waiver program and things like that are where the huge gaps are, you know, like the easiest thing. We have the visa <clears throat> waiver program with 37 different countries. That means that anyone from those 37 countries can come into the United States with almost no, you know, processing whatsoever. It's crazy. Right. They said the day, that's one thing they said to meet the press, that the they should be looking at the visa program. It may be broken. Yeah. Like, you know, like, why would anyone go through the hassle of trying to actually become, you know, legally enter, you know, you'd take the easiest route, right? It's not even necessary. Like even the refugee system, like they were saying, you know, that um, from what I've heard, you know, none of the att attackers in Paris have been linked to be like Syrian refugees although they said they thought someone might be now they're saying that no they aren't uh, someone from the un said that um it's like uh you you wouldn't need to go through a complex system like that all you would need to do is get into one country that's easy to get into and then go straight into france and then you can go from france to the united states right yeah, i did um it's changed quite a bit the canadian system they they, they check over you have the interview but then you have two years you can they give I forgot what they give you, but it's um, some visa or you get two years and then you got these these things like you got to be able to support yourself. You mm -hmm. you don't get into trouble. You don't have a, a meeting with the Vancouver police and a yeah. couple of nights in the cell. You keep you keep keep yourself clean. You, you know, and then they have a chat with you after two years, and then and then either you get offered citizenship or they say to you this ain't working you need to go back wherever you came from mm -hmm. that to me that makes more sense that you give somebody okay. a couple of years to settle down and prove that they're gonna be hey. you know but yeah you know. i want to go to the break but uh one thought is morton it'd be nice to have morton on i could we could have morton from canada on one naturalized citizen there on this topic almost yeah, it'd be an interesting person to bring on the show overall we'll talk about later so let's i was a republican elected to local office active you know, vice mayor of a city before the war broke out. And I can say that most the farmers lean towards Republicans. I'd say it seemed like 70, 80 percent, maybe higher of the farm owners. And they are all very pro. Hey, let's let the floodgates in of immigrants, of, you know, of, of Mexicans to pick on the field. I mean, if you were. They would ask you that question to get the endorsements from the farmers, Farm Bureau. I mean, they, they hit around that. Well, and I mean, they didn't want yeah, anybody closing down the borders. Of the aisle, I mean, because the economic benefits of having open borders far surpass the interests of the American public, which, you know, is m majority would like to have that problem addressed. So it's funny how consistently the public in polling has shown that they're against, you know, the high levels of, you know, unregulated immigration, and illegal immigration that we have. Mm -hmm. And yet politically, nothing is done to address right. that. It's, all, it's all smoke. You're totally right, Sam. It's all smoke and mirrors. If, if it's, a, you, it's representative of how our politics do not reflect what the American people want. No, yeah, right. um, I'm not anti-immigration, but you've got, you got, you got to stop 
Um, you, where, where you know you don't need big walls. Sam, move right? your mic up a little bit closer. Yeah, sure. You don't need a big wall just around the country. You just need you to make game. make it very, very difficult to employ people who haven't got official visas. You know, you got to make. You know, you got to make it interesting to do that. No, and the penalties, and they have real investigation, and they have massive penalties, and have them involved. Cheap enforced. labor is something that's extremely interesting. Um, the consumer population replacement, since the United States doesn't replace its own population at a rate of, you know, two, which is what you need to just replace the population, the government, and um, you know corporations want immigration to replace the consumers to keep a high number of consumers in the country you know what i mean and i mean yeah. in certain terms like they make the argument that we need you know immigration in order to replace our population for you know sustainability purposes but economically it's just not interesting to try to regulate it you know i just think it's interesting how these there's these specific issues like this where you know it is obvious that the majority of the American people want for this to be addressed in some way or another, hmm. you know, and how it's, it's not even in the discussion. But yeah. if you, you just wouldn't get, um, I, I, in some way, see, it's, it's like all these type of subjects, you get, you get pure biology and then you get kind of biology mixed with common sense. Um, yeah. and basically I'm not prepared to sacrifice common sense for my personal ideology, um, unlike a lot of people I meet. Um, you know, so, history repeats itself, Jonathan. Yeah, so um, basically you need to tighten up in some parts and you need to loosen up in others. You need the right type of people, but that's up to everybody to decide what are the right type. But um, you don't actually need, you know, what Trump's talking about, some massive wall. No, you don't need a massive wall. You need you need the factors that drive people, I, the prospect of if you haven't got a Social Security card or any documentation, you'll still be able to find a living in America. If you remove that, nobody's apart from the really, truly, truly desperate are going to come here because if they can't, if they can't fight, make a living, send money, money, money back home, they ain't doing it. Yeah. Hey, um, we'll talk. Maybe we'll talk about this next week. Maybe we'll maybe we'll put that on on projection predictions or something. But <coughs> next week, maybe look into the Basario program. Um, there are three two times I can see where um, Mexican Mexicans from Mexico have been deported back to the United States. One was actually during the '30s. I just I'm looking at this right now uh, during the depression and um, under FDR and then Eisenhower, they deported 500 and 1.1 million under um, under Eisenhower what were deported. Yeah, so it was they, interesting though as well. Um, last week they reported that officially um, there are uh, more Mexicans leaving the United States than coming in, which is the reversal of a trend that has spanned over, you know, decades and decades so it's pretty monumental shift that's taking place a lot of people argue in terms of um the economic inequality in the united states that's not interesting for them to as interesting because there isn't as much um opportunity here next week we might want to talk about that and just see what what situation is one of the magnets they say is the social welfare social welfare programs are magnet Look, okay. just a thought before we go on, but the social welfare programs are a magnet that didn't used to exist. And yeah. that between I've heard between ten and fifteen million undocumented. Uh, I think I think Sam's saying the call of nature is coming. Yeah, yeah. Is it right to the restroom real quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we'll come back. Okay. The last right eight minutes of the reported section, and we'll come back and then I'll Sorry for the up. inconvenience. I'll be right back. No, it's not an inconvenience at all. Jonathan, take it away. We're gonna go get some more coffee. I love right, thank you, Bill. Well, you really got to get Sam's voice up. Yours is pretty <laughs> good today. Sam's is good. Sam's a little weak. He needs to get that mic a little closer. Right. Let's have a look. See, so um, Chuck says the Harvest crew working the blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, I haven't got your experience, you know, like most things, Chuck. My experience comes from the media and you um, on the radio and other documentation. You tend to read some horrendous stories of exploitation um what the reality i, I can't really pass comment like i say m most of my 
knowledge of it. Um, you know, I think, I just think the whole system needs to be cleaned up, modernised, made more fair, more down to earth. Um, also, um, I think I, I want to make one thing clear that kind of um, might make me less obvious of a, a Christian socialist is that um, I don't go uh, go around attacking feder federalism, but I do believe that decision making should be as local as possible. So, um, um, which a lot on the left don't really. Uh, really push or clarify i'm really um about decision making should be regional um city state as much as possible um to me the people in the area that know their economical um, drivers of their local economy and um, in some ways i think we become much too federalized in our decision making um, this is a very large country with a very diverse population from very different historical backgrounds. And um, I think a more federalised to the regional federalised system would be better. You, go. you guys ready to start again or Jonathan? Yeah. Yeah. Discussion. So I'm going to read off these points. I, I'll project, I know what I like before we go. I'd like to write down what you're project. I could not listening to it. What's your long, Jonathan, before we start, what's your long-term, short-term? My, my long, I'll tell you my long-term is still that the FBI has an open investigation that Hillary Clinton, I believe, will probably not be the nominee from the Democrats because of the FBI investigation. Um, I'm not well, going to argue anybody's projection. Just give, give, put them out. Um, it's, it's difficult. I, I can't really, I can give you a couple long, longer term. Well, because the short term, there doesn't seem... They really, it's term. quite, it's quite active that there's not really much going on. It's uh, maybe it's because it's November, you just before December, everybody's just looking at going home Christmas. for Christmas, but there's not much. Yeah. Um, more medium, long term, medium. I think if there's more attacks like what we had in Paris, um, Hillary, Jeff, and the, and the more, and the more, established seen as the established candidates yeah can only benefit because people tend to stop they don't question enough already but they tend to so let's just stop. say keep it short established candidates because of the threat will uh, improve in the polls well benefit will benefit in the polls and improve it will improve and it's just the opposite. If there if there's an economic shock in the first quarter two oh six, the more less traditional candidates will benefit from that. Um, so it's but a kind of duality. You, there. you can't. You got to give a prediction. My, you know, you got to sort of stand. Well, my but my prediction is that um, unless um, I think here is such a dead loss. Um, <laughs> She's such a has been and such a liar um, that, but the the Democratic establishment seems to be signing the longest suicide note in <laughs> politics. Um, um, you know, they you know, it's obviously a Bernie should be the candidate for the Democratic Party. Yeah. It's pretty clear that you know that he is, you know, but the only way they're going to steal it from him is what they're doing at the present moment. Which is like I say again, which is the longest suicide yeah. letter that's ever been written we in politics. Got to this to a long-term projection. Um, Stand by one, and then a short term. And then the other one is. What, what is it? What is your long-term projection? I still think, even though they're doing their best, Bernie will become the candidate because here he's such a dead Lee, loss. Lee, Lee, that's a good one, Bernie Sanders. I think that's really legitimate. Sanders yeah. will, will be the nominee. That's a good one. Yeah, that's a real. Um, I mean, I think, and you can change that down the road, but leave that. that your long one shouldn't tr change from week to week. The short ones can change. The, the, the other thing is I'm going to say something. I actually believe that Trump is going to be the candidate for the Republican Party. You can put I both think, that into one. I think they're totally underestimating. 
I don't think he's mucking around at all. I think he's going for it. And I think he's deadly serious about becoming the Republican candidate. And I think there's, the rest of the candidates are so dire, so bad, so dismal that I actually um, I can't stand the guy. I, I really can't stand Trump. But I, I think he is going to get the candidate. Why don't you leave your long term at that? And you can change it down the road that, that, Bernie Sanders, that Bernie Sanders will be the nominee and Trump will be the nominee. That's a good long term. That's what we're trying to get at. Yeah. And my long term is more specific that the FBI investigation will take uh, Hillary out. And I would guess Bernie will probably get the nomination unless unless the establishment you know throws in another candidate at the last minute. Well, I'll say that, but I do want to say one caveat that. But when if Bernie did become the candidate, um, I hope he's got a lot of security because the the history uh, of more progressive democratic candidates is that they get they get assassinated in this country, and um, I hope. But I think he knows that anyway, and he still decided that he's you know for the good of the country, he's going for it. Yeah, I can think of the Kennedys situation, not not. A- not JFK, but the, his brother, Robert. Bobby, 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 Doctor yeah. King, anybody, King, yeah. anybody that really tries and change things in this country, they get shot normally, don't they? That's that's true to some extent. That's I mean I've never thought about that. That's that's a good point. Leave it, stay, keep it simple though, and keep your long term. Sam, what's your long term? Um, long term is uh, that we're going to see an increase in widely unreported. Um, uh, crimes against uh, people of the Muslim faith. I would say that's a shorter. Term. You don't want to say that's shorter term than long term, like midterm. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So okay. Just, well, just, I mean, it's kind of that's a legitimate right? short term. When I like that for short term, midterm. I think that it's going to be interesting how we see this. Um, you know, in the long term and in the short term, unfortunately, but um, the relationship between Iran, uh, Russia, and the United States and France, and how that's going to play mm. itself out by way of these um, relationships with Middle Eastern countries through different organizations. <sighs> And how they're going to twist and turn that around is going to be super interesting. I don't think that any coalition is going to be formed between Russia that involves Russia and the United States. That seems highly unlikely. And, um, and um, you know, as far as the presidential, you know, campaign goes, I, I would like to think that you're right, Bill, but I'm not so sure about No, that. I'm, I'm just on the FBI. That's just, that's what I feel. I think something's going to come real nasty. I hope um, that so the long the long term is you think that uh, some European countries in Russia will form a coalition? No, they will not. They will not because they, uh, some you people are hypothesizing that some kind of coalition is going to be formed involving Russia and the United States, which in terms of their political interests, I, in I don't that, think Russia and the United States will form a coalition. People are talking about that, but I don't think it'll happen. I think it more likely. Well, I think I think what's happened really, Sam, is because of these two disastrous wars, America's influence over its uh, its semi puppet uh, states of Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf states has been greatly reduced mm-hmm. because America's effect effectiveness um, economically and military has been and it's just been greatly reduced in the region. So Saudi Arabia and their Gulf allies have gone off on their own. And um, the other factor is Turkey. Um, Turkey, it's not really spelled out, but Turkey would rather have ISIS win. than meet the press talk about that today. Rather than having a really Kurdish, you know, their nightmare is an independent Kurdish state. And they rather see the Turkey Kurds. Turkey has supported ISIS, correct? Pardon? Inadvertently, like they've sent. They're, they've still got a border, and they're you know that border's there. And they're not but they coming. rather they rather see that nightmare on their border than a Kurdish established like, state. We had Northern Watch gonna... and Southern Watch, and they would not. They cut off the northern approach for the longest time on the invasion of Iraq because yeah. of the Kurds. No, from what I understood, Turkey had already has already for some time now been helping ISIS. In oh, yeah, definitely, so they definitely. But the Saudi, no, this, uh, this, this whole argument that the, the, the this these crowd of psychopaths have been supporting, you know, they've got over 40,000 fighters. Yeah. The average one gets paid $600, $800 a month. 
And they're, they're supposed to finance this from internal taxation. It's just a heap of crap. They, they, they're getting their money from the Saudi Arabians, the Gulf states, and the Turks. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm well, trying to pin you guys down now. No so. one's talking about the expansion of the Iran of Iran's empire. You know what I mean? The the role that they're playing and what's oh, going yeah. on in all of these countries, and you know the behind the scenes stuff that they've been doing for a really long time. You know, yeah, I'm, Sam, I'm trying to be as succinct as possible. We've got a long term for Jonathan. We've got a mid a mid term, short term for you, but we don't have a long term. So. What do you want to put down? Your your midterm, short term is the anti-Muslim sentiment, which I think is an accurate project. And Jonathan, I mean, what do you want to put for long term? It sound, you know, the the well, I think uh, not, not Jonathan, not uh, Sam. Yes, What's your long term? That honestly, it's it's sort of similar. Like I think that I, I in the next coming week before you know we get together again, like there we're going to see an increase in attacks um, on ISIS. There's going to be an increase of underreported, unacknowledged uh, crimes against people who are Muslim who are, who, or who appear to be Muslim mm -hmm. um, all over Europe and the United States. And I think that there's, I would love to not say this, but you're asking, you know, I think that the chance of another attack is. Oh, definitely. Yeah. In the short term. And, and Actually, the attacks these the attacks. Is, I, honestly, I, I just think that the short term and long term, they're the same. And that um, the way that the right is going to continue to perpetuate this Islamophobia for, you know, the purpose of um, creating a stronger base, you know, like separating the parties out more uh, clearly and creating support for themselves is going to have uh, consequences that might even outweigh the attacks in Paris. You know what I mean? Yeah. What I'd like you to do is talk about your short term and then go on and say that about your long term, how it evolves into something even more stronger. And I think between you and I, you probably agree. I think that caveat will, would build until maybe the next election. I just want to say something really quickly about this. Um, I think what is proposing, which is much of the same, um, a lot of the Russians, Iranians laugh at the, um, the allied attacks on ISIS, saying that these so-called bombing attacks, you know, that's just pure propaganda. Um, but the other factor is um, if we continue with the same policies, I actually I only see it encouraging more, more foreigners to join ISIS. So yeah. actually um, it's a recruiting. If you look at the um, ISIS's um, manifesto, um, I read um, a bunch of excerpts from it. It's lovely, isn't it? Dark, yeah. dark, dark you know, they, they explicitly say how this is what we would like for Europe and the United States to do. We want for people in these countries to become Islamophobic and treat people of this faith poorly because every time they do and every time they attack us and every time they kill innocent people, they create more people to follow us. And their countries are separating themselves from the values upon which they are based. That's what they're trying to do. You know, we're well, separating know, ourselves from our constitution, that, from... Yeah. The Taliban believe the same way. Yeah, they want my the hand. Thing too, is that people didn't realize is when we had collateral damage, which we really tried to avoid to the nth degree, and it does happen. I mean, I had one it's captain pull out two yeah. two little uh, Afghan kids that the French dropped a mortar into. It had you know, and we we pulled a lot yeah, of. Yeah, I just want to get back because no, uh, no, but I I want to talk about this real fast. Yeah, it's the Taliban, the opponents. They always use these media sources to over bloat those these casualties. For example, the casualties were well under five, six, seven hundred the last years of the war that we were really involved in Afghanistan fighting of civilians. And that sounds like a lot, but as soon as we pulled out of our combat role and up front and doing the things we we're doing, those jumped to five thousand a year uh, between the fighting between the um, what was being and we count when those that five six hundred is both what happens from the. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say us. something you're not going to like about that, Bill, but fundamentally, do you really think that, that those figures were truly honest figures? Wasn't there a lot of massage and encouragement to reduce the casualty figures as much I, as possible? I was right there where the casualty figures come in at the briefs. I mean, right there at the two-star. We were at two-star level for a long time, went to three. I was right there on these these casualty figures. And I think we're pretty accurate. Well, right. you you were there. I, I, I believe. I know you wouldn't know about it. I, I think they're pretty accurate. I mean, we. I paid one of my jobs early on in the war, civil military operations, as a lieutenant colonel, is I paid condolence payments. Right. When people get killed in combat, uh, of civilians, or even some war fighters. We would help the families out, and it varied. the The, the max payment 
I think it was seven thousand dollars, but most payments were just a couple hundred dollars. But depending on the on how the person was killed, I mean, we I had a captain who carried out a little girl who had been hit by uh, bully Pete, which you're not even supposed to use. Well, uh, white phosphorus had hailed it. She wasn't supposed to survive. We got her back to Bagram in the hospital, and she survived. Yeah, and that's the highest payout I paid to the the father. The both the parents were killed. Uh, two of her brothers were killed. She, I think, was the only survivor. But I remember that captain who pulled her out. We had these little teams of officers who go up, and, and an officer with three enlisted go up behind the war and help the civilians. We're very, I think, we're a very kind nation. When I see what happens, but he, uh, I had well, to, I, the I, I had to recommend the, that he I'll leave theater the air thirty air. days later because he had nightmares every night after that incident. I think the average American is okay, but I, I, I think the, I think the people that run the country. Well, let's be frank about this. I, I think a lot of Americans don't understand the setup. The setup is this, Bill: the people that control this country. It's about money, and they, they don't really care how many orphans people lose their houses, jobs lost. They really, do. as, long as, as long as the bottom line they, goes... They won't that, say that. No one will say that. that they and care. the idea that the, the crew that run... And it's no different in Britain. The crew that run this country, yeah. do you really think they care toss about deaths of foreigners? They don't really care that much about deaths in their own country. Well, I, don't there, Paul, I think we do. I really, I, well, Jonathan, I, 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 I'm, I'm sort of really black and white on this. ISIS is an example of people who don't care. They don't oh, care. God, they they, they, they slaughter. And, and we we care, but I'll tell you what, at some point we pulled out of Iraq and we carried a vacuum and gazillions of, a lot of people were slaughtered because of our actions. I think it's a actions. contradiction of terms to put extremism and not caring in the same, I'm not saying they're caring about something that's good, but they're obviously having beliefs and values that are, right? Yeah. Well, it's I not think, like a random, you know, yeah, but highly this, organized this, 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 attacks this, this, that are full It's of a events. really difficult thing, Sam, but I, I heard there, there was one guy reported he was with the uh, Iraqi army. And terror, unless you, you like the Kurds, it doesn't, the Kurds really believe in something. Yeah, they, yeah, they believe. The, the Iraqi army, when they heard, I heard that there was like three regiments, almost 18,000 men, fully armed by the Americans with a pretty good equipment. They were facing at the most 500 of the, right? <laughs> they heard they were coming, Sam. They laid down their arms and they did a runner because they didn't want to get captured and then be beheaded. And I can't exactly, Initially, blame, yeah. I can't, on in reverse direction. I can't precisely blame them, Sam. Um, but, when you allow terror and fear to enter your heart, they they just haven't got the passion, you know. You know, if you you know, they they just it works for some people. Me, uh, you know, but it depends, doesn't it? You know, yeah, I'd love really to get some of my guys on. Jonathan, bring, up, bring back memories though. I had um, one of my we had PhDs in our teams, but we, in, later on, when I did the re, high re, research with anthropologists, but we had uh, what we called. Um, cultural i forgot the title that they had and they got rid of that position it was a gs12 and one of my gs12s had been a christian in the uh iraqi army under saddam hussein and he got out and later on become an interpreter and then had citizenship and then worked his way back onto this program as a cultural is a cultural advisor we had uh three levels we had these these field gatherers collectors you know technicians who were cultural advisors then we had um GS-13s, who were the uh, people who helped me put all the document systems and reporting together. Then we had the PhDs, and the PhDs had leverage to go everywhere. And they were 1410s, and I was a 15, 1, and 2. So that's how our teams were organized. But it's what you said. I just thought the Iraqi army, they've gone through hell in 20 years. You think we've got a hard time because the United States pounded them, you know, when we attacked them. We, we, when we hit them the first time, we hit them hard. Who the Iraqi army? Well, yeah, but that killed a lot of Iraqi army people. 
Yeah, but it's it's just been oh, a it's just been it's just been a mindless bloodbath for the past I don't fifteen years. I understand years. how we can like Iraq know, is con- consistently acknowledge rampant corporate elitism and corruption of government. We're at a point where eighty three percent of Americans believe that the government is controlled by major corporations. That's a good segue. We can, you know, that'll lead right into this last point when we talk. I'm going to bring up those points. I'm going to read them, and I'll let you guys talk about them, and I'll be quiet. I want to do your predictions, short term and long term, and that'll be it for a cut. We got to do all this in eight minutes. Okay. I just want to ask one quick question, Bill, um, of you because you were in Afghanistan. Um, I know, I know the Taliban. They get money from taxation, and mm-hmm. also they get money. They deny it, but some people say they get a bit of money from the drug industry. Oh, big time! And- oh, big time! Yeah. Yeah, oil too, but do but do you it, but i doubt oh, ISIS, I'm sorry. yeah i doubt but i still doubt that that's enough my, my experience of northern ireland is that most terrorists effective terrorist organization need the support and the financial and other resources of a country of a state to support them I, I believe that the Pakistan government is still financing the Taliban to a high extent, or certain parts of the Pakistan government. But they, 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 in the tribal areas, they, they go there every winter and hang out. And we try to get the Pakistanis to root them out and not allow the safe havens. That's where they go in the winter. What they do, Jonathan, you hit it right That's on. That's where they are now, though, and have been for a moment, right? Al-Qaeda has been in Pakistan and hasn't moved for yeah, a minute. Yeah, the tribal areas. Yeah, and the madrasas and all that. But... What they do, though, it's the way they make money is, one is they have a shadow government everywhere. Every province has a shadow government, and we usually knew who they were. We could identify them, but as soon as you kill one of them or get rid of one, they put another one in. And then they have uh, taxation. They tax uh, businesses and people and everything. Uh, they, when the trucks move up and down the roads to deliver supplies and material, they have a tax there. You know, they, they tax the trucks as they move between checkpoints. We have the Afghan army trying to stop that and try to do certain things. But they, so there's payoffs. It's, it's more like a, a mafia and they're better organized. The, the Afghan government now is better organized. But what happened is after the Russians left, they had a, a sort of an ad hoc government, but they really had 12 warlords who fought among themselves. And by weakening themselves, the Taliban were able, able to come over. I forgot the exact date, but they came into Jalalabad where I was initially in mass at 2000 with Toyotas and, they were funded, I'm pretty sure they were funded by uh, Wahhabis back then when they invaded, and that was pa- uh, Saudi Arabia. It wasn't us at that time. So they came across en masse. They had Wahhabism. They imposed a very strict religion uh, on the people, and they killed a lot of people, and they ran out the the tribal lords, the 12 of them, including the king who co- tried to come back. So, And then the Taliban took over, and then they had the safe haven for uh, al-Qaeda and uh, – Bin Laden, and that's why we went to war because they provided a safe haven. They almost turned over Bin Laden, came very close to turning over Bin Laden. But Mullah Omar, who was the president of the time of the caliph or the top caliph, um, would not turn him over, and he no. was in control. That was a bit of a mis- that was a bit of a political mistake, wasn't it? Mullah Omar not turning. Yeah, they could have turned him over, and not gone to war, and <laughs> captured him. I actually have been right in Jalalabad where he stepped off the plane. I would have parceled him up and then shipped him by UBS to you, Bill. But he would not Omar. Would, <laughs> Mullah Omar, really. So that's when we went to war. And we, and we took over very, very fast. Twelve people were killed the first year of fighting. It was mostly special forces. But then the Taliban reorganized. Yeah, and I think that uh, justifiable, great. But what made, what was the crazy idea that you that you're going to stay there? Um, it's just, a, it's uncontrolled. It's hard. I mean, if you don't, you can have a vacuum. Well, who a vacuum was the, around. who was the big brain that thought it was a good idea to stay I, in I, I think in Afghanistan? In, I think we have to be there in a small, I think we, I'm not, I wasn't a proponent of the big buildups of the troops, the hundred thousand troops, but I do think we needed <laughs> like 10,000 troops and we need a special force. I know who the brain was. It was old Shaney and the other bloody cons in that government that, well, you know, what, what, what a mastermind, what a mastermind idea that was. So you know, you, you, in, you sort it out and you leave. That's well, what you, you do. You Let me show you how it evolved. Since I was stationed at, in, in uh, Leavenworth for five years doing this research, they had these centers for research and excellence in Lebanon, in, Lebanon, in, in um, Leavenworth. 
Petraeus was in charge of the center before the buildups. He developed all these plans and thoughts, and it become they had two things. They said counterterrorism or coin counterinsurgency. So we had this new policy called counterinsurgency. It's where you take a lot of money and you throw it with soldiers and you try to win the hearts and minds and stabilize it like a police force. And that worked in Iraq for a short period of time, but we didn't stabilize it. We completely pulled out and sort of created a new vacuum. In, Pac in Afghanistan, it never worked. We built up, we secured them, we pulled out. And I, I would say there's very little improvement there. The, the people are getting slaughtered there, the Afghans themselves. Okay, the, the, you know, um, people don't realize how it's still bad there. I hate Kabul too. Hey, let's get on. We got to finish this up eight minutes. I want to bring in people for discussion. Yeah, that's where we really build numbers. So I'm going to read off this sex scandal. Why? And I'm going to let you guys talk, and we'll go with projections. Keep your um, projections short. Don't talk a lot on them. Your short term, long term. I want to write these down this week. Uh, and the short. I didn't even come up with my short term yet. Oh my! I'll think about what we're talking because I don't have a short term right now. I, it's the hardest one to come up with, of course. So here we go. Back on. Yep. We are recording. We're back <coughs> off break. I don't know what happened there. I've got to check things, so I'll have to cut this. You'll see our friends again, Bill. Who knows? Hey, so I'm going to talk about a prominent Republican, uh, Frank Fahrenheit. I uh, said there, there are seven things that we're destroying our country right now, or why the the political parties are not following the normal ways and breaking the rules within their own party, and why we have the right and the left out there leading as opposed to the centrists. And the, we had the centrists for 20 years. And he said, because of this, because of sex scandals, financial scandals, two, two unwon wars, four is economic meltdown in 2008 with attempted recovery. Number five is not even pretend to control our borders from both parties. Number six is loss of trust and confidence in corporations, banks, and some churches. Number seven is unhappy times in our country. So I've got the link to that point, and I just put the links in the note here. Let you guys go ahead and talk about it. Go ahead, Jonathan. Well, I, th I think... They're kind of all linked, but I, I think um, it started with Reagan. Um, but I think I always like, uh, you know, um, I'm kind of going to I always did like old Ronnie in a way. I don't know why, but I, I always had a little bit of a soft point, even though his policies in Central America were a disaster. Um, but I always had a soft bit for Ronnie. But the rock really set in. Um, under the first Bush, and then it really set it in under the Clintons, who um, are monsters, um, true monsters. But get back to it, um, the, normally most countries, if the multitude are doing well, the elite will do even better. So the, unless they lose the plot, it's best to keep the multitude reasonably happy. Um, <laughs> but what's happened in the past 30 years with globalization, it's no longer necessary for these corporations and the elite that run them to really care about the American multitude. They really couldn't care less about the living standards of Americans, and they really don't really care what happens. They, um, as long as Americans just keep coughing up and sucking it um they're just going to get much as what they got for the past 20 years they these corporations ain't backing down unless they're forced to um they're also making a ton of money out of these wars um the elite in washington are totally divorced from reality they they have no understanding of what's going on in the country nor do they want to um that's the kind of scenario you're that's that's the reality hey jonathan i i wasn't going to ask a question but chuck brings up he asked no what is the elite define what the elite i think you defined what you considered the elite but go ahead and well say now you see it in england there there is this kind of um princeton um yale stanford um they have these. They have, they go to private schools. They they pass these these stupid freaking exams that if you gave a chimpanzee enough training could pass. But um, what was been, the uh, in was it Princeton? They had the well. Let's face it. If George Bush, uh, if George Bush could get into Yale, a chimpanzee, oh, yeah. a chimpanzee could get in there. Um, well, you know, like, Yale, Yale, they had the crossbow, crossbones, and skull. 
But they've got these, they've got these <laughs> exams, and they're, and they're specifically designed to allow the, the children of the elite to pass them. It's the same in Britain with Cambridge and Oxford. Yeah. These exams are not... They've got nothing to do with intelligence. You could, if you give somebody enough one-to-one training, years of training, they will pass these exams flying. But they, they, they don't judge somebody's okay. quality. So anyway, the elite is just that evolution has come up, and you know, even Obama's wife went to Princeton. I'm pretty they sure all, has those connections. From CGI, the, which is a corporation, well, where where come from these things? colleges, and they all meet with exactly. the same people and building they talk about that yeah. so anyway sam yeah. i'm gonna let you finish up on this topic then we're gonna go to projections and it'll be the end of the recorded show unless we bring up <clears throat> folks you know offline onto the recording yeah it's interesting because like you know i keep hearing a couple of references as though this is um something that's unprecedented i mean elitism and and the you know the elite in the united states is like something that goes back to the beginning of this country where you know the system was designed to benefit, you know, white Protestant landowning men. Those are the only people that were allowed to vote. Those are the people that were designed to benefit from the system. But, um, you know, so I just don't think this is like a new phenomenon. I don't. The United States has progressed, I mean, a, a long way since those times. But well, I mean, it's weird because a lot of, in a lot of ways, systems just get more um, like, I guess, perfected if you're thinking in terms of elitist greed and things like that, where you have you can create these, um, you know, give people the right to vote, but undereducate them, make them poor and busy and consumers and, you know, uninterested so that they don't vote. You know, it's like these perfect but, things. Uh, like I know Republicans know, and Democrats. Like new colonial, that, colonialism. Would, yeah. I know Republicans and Democrats would absolutely argue against that philosophy that a lot of, a lot of my friends, the people I'm with, that believe that education breaks the cycle of poverty and we want to educate all people because yeah it depends what you call education because i think the education establishment in britain and here are two of the biggest rackets they make the insurance industry and the uh, <laughs> medical industry look quite quite decent actually I, I really i'm surprised how they really it is a real racket in britain and america the education establishment they have the you know, I just didn't realize how exam crazy this country is. Sam, In, I'm, I didn't want to cut you off, but I, I agree with you, Jonathan. But I, sorry to cut you off, but go ahead, Sam, and finish up. That'll be the end. Um. Yeah. Uh, what were we talking about? So talking this guy about the, the seven points, and you were talking about um, how people felt and, 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 and the lack of trust, the corporate, you know, the seven issues that were brought up by um, Frankenhoff. Yeah, it seems kind of superficial to me, you know, like as though these are um, these are new ideas or as though, I mean, I guess what bothers me the most is that we just keep giving validity to moral arguments, you know, for the sake of persuading people, you know, like um, arguments about religion or arguments about culture or women's rights or things to justify stuff when all we need to look at is who's profiting off of this. Yeah. You know, just trace the money. It always explains yeah, what's it's, going on. It's like a murder. You're so right, Sam. It's a bit like a murder investigation. You don't have to be Einstein. You just look who gets the benefit, don't you? Yeah. And it's it, like the way that the system has perfected itself where, um, you know, arguably, like we, we kind of, um, you know, support businesses, even though they're, you know, they have this tendency to be greedy and, or greedy and corrupt and whatever. We support them because they create jobs, because they participate in our economy, et cetera, et cetera. And now these corporations have found ways to totally subvert those systems so they contribute absolutely nothing to our societies and yet to maximize their own profits by storing profits offshore by you know getting uh labor from different countries that have lower standards and cost less than us and it, like, where's the benefit coming from and yet we still have people who are saying hey we need to deregulate the private sector come on guys well, i'm gonna finish <laughs> we want to try to stay in, in time standards and i'm gonna let you have the last word and that's you got it <clears throat> well, maybe we'll talk next week we'll put together uh a discussion panel. It's really gone off course, that's for sure, because two weeks ago you're going to be brought on as as with your studies to look at the uh, incarceration specifically in California, and we haven't been able to do that yet. Hey, I want to go to projections real fast, long term, short term. I want to give mine, Jonathan and Sam will let you finish. So my uh, long term is is the same, and I'm going to write these down on our blog this time. That the FBI will come down with the with it, whether they come down with an indictment or not. It's going to be public information and that Hillary Clinton will not win the Democrat 
nomination, Democratic nomination, that someone else will come in. It'll probably be Bernie Sanders. And then for my short term, that's hard to give a short term right now because so much has happened. So my short term is going to be that we're all going to eat turkey for Thanksgiving. That's probably a really bad one. That's not a good one. We're going to have a good Thanksgiving. The United States is going to do much Thanksgiving is here. So what was that? I said I'm a vegetarian, so Bill's predictions are already um, wrong. Yeah, I can't say that. (laughs) I but, actually probably will not be eating turkey because I, I, about six months ago, I watched a, a documentary called Earthlings. I think you came uh, over last year to my house. Yeah, and it kind of um, put me off meat a lot. So yeah. I still have a bit. But we'll see. Um, we'll see what happens. Well, Jonathan, those are my two. Uh, what's your long-term, short-term? Long-term should be staying pretty consistent, and then short-term should change. Short-term, mid-term. So what was your long term? I got it here, sorta. My long term is my long term is I think actually Bernie is going to get the the, uh, the Democratic nomination. My short term is I think Trump will strengthen. In the know, short term, really? Yeah, come back. Yeah. That's interesting. But you also said that Trump will probably get the nomination. I think I do. Good. I do honestly, yeah. um, but you never know. But I yeah. think I think he's in a. He has found a winning. I don't think they're, they're trying to out Trump Trump, and yeah. I just don't think you can do it. Jonathan, we'll talk about this later. That's interesting because a lot of people thought it would help Bush, but it might help Trump this, you know, this. Yeah, I don't think anybody can out Trump Trump for bigotry, <laughs> ignorance, stupidity. And um, we'll see who the gurus are. He's, he, if, you, if you're trying to outdo him on those points, I think you're on a losing wicket. Sam, I know your long-term and short-term tie into each other. So give that, and that'll be the end of the Go open. Yeah, it's just different. You know, what actual things are we going to see, like, in the week to come? I think that there's going to be um, an increase in attacks upon people who are Muslim or who appear to be Muslim. And, that, and it's unfortunately not going to be talked about enough. I'm hoping uh, that there won't be more attacks this week. But the reality is, is that we just, we've gone through some in the last couple of days, except they happened in the Middle East. So no one talked about it. No one cared. Um, but, uh, yeah, ISIS is done multiple other attacks between Paris and now. And in the long term, it's the same sort of thing, like um, a lot of uh, increase in violence on Muslims and increase in activity of ISIS. I yeah, this, this, is what, this is what makes me laugh, Sam, that we say vo- most of the people that are killed by these crazy buggers are Muslims. Yeah. They're, they're killing bloody other Muslims left, right and centre. You know, you think yeah. the you think the people in Paris was a lot. They kill that many every hour. You know, they're, yeah. they're you know they're butchering other Muslims. And the idea, you know, we're going to con- continue. I'm. I think more bombings are going to happen foreseeably. You know, obviously within this week, and you know, we're going to continue to try and bomb a terrorist organization, which most political scientists will admit you can't defeat a terrorist organization by bombing it you know what i mean like that's the yeah. need uh, that's good sam i appreciate that and i said you're gonna have the last question but i'm gonna bring this both to everybody's point we'll talk about mm-hmm. this after the show but, you know article five has not been uh, been been initiated or been requested by the french yet uh, article excuse me article is article five of the, the yeah, it's article five, yeah. yeah has been that's interesting hey thanks for everyone listening in last week we had over a thousand people live come up and on we had over a couple hundred people watch oh. it later <laughs> So we, last week was an amazing show, but amazing things happened. I'm sure we'll get a few hundred this week, maybe more. We're going to keep it open for open conversation for a couple hours. We get some unique people on. Yeah, I, will I, I can I can stay just before 12, Bill, and then I've got to be off. Why don't you take this first session, Jonathan? I'm going to back off. I'll be watching and monitoring, you Sam. Keep, you, you're going to keep with me, Sam. You get to lead the way. Yeah, sure. So Jonathan's yeah. going to lead the conversation here. You've got some really good foot, Chuck. I hope you come up. Uh, I'm going to be on standby, and I'll be on the side watching and monitoring. Yeah, come back about 10 to 12, Bill. Thanks, everybody, coming. Check uh, to meetthevoter.com. I also want to give a heads up to Jonathan. Jonathan's website is WP Tonic. That's his business, and it's a place yeah. where you can sort of find and see what he does. Sam, we I don't maintain, know, we're, I'm the WordPress junkie, aren't I, Bill? We actually have a very, very successful WordPress uh uh, iTunes it's show, very well. successful. It's our biggest show. Uh, Sam, what do you do? What do you, how can the uh, listener reach you? Um, you can follow me on Instagram at Sam Brooks Politics or on Twitter at Sam Brooks Poly, P O L I, both all together. And I need to improve the website at meetthevoter.com. That's a big story. I had a bad load on it, it's a little bulky. I might have to reload it, but I do want to get everyone's bio there and points of contact so we can everyone can get a hold of Nick. By the way, one thing, Nick, Dr. Nicholas Hernandez could not make it this week. He had uh, the privilege of being invited as a, a guest up to San Francisco to the opening of 
the Hispanic Museum. I, I know, I, I think it was, um, I forgot the name. It was a Mexican American museum that was opened up in San Francisco. And he was one of the uh, invited guests. So he was up in San Francisco this week. He should be back with us next week. So yeah. thanks. Cool. In from a long trip. Oh, yeah. Do you have a nice time? Of, of gay marriage, uh, I mean, all those years it was illegal. Then it was it was uh, legal, but had to be hidden away. You know, homosexuality, and and then it was it took a what forty odd years when they had allowed. Um, I've forgotten what it's called. But it's not married. They had something which wasn't marriage, but was a, a, a financial arrangement. We're just gradually becoming more open. It's very slow, isn't it? Very slow. I don't feel like that. I feel like there's, um, when I look at what's going on in my generation, when I look at like this abundance of entirely new ways of seeing, and through my studies of political history and the history of political philosophy, I know that these ideas have never been brought up before. They're absolutely new ideas about the ways we see each other, you know, um, postmodern political thought, like, and um, I, I feel like it is unprecedented. I mean, if you look at the, the gay marriage issue itself, when I came out of the closet, I was 15 years old. And I, it was unimaginable that ever, um, you know, gay marriage would become legal. And you flash okay. forward 10 years and it's being legalized, you know? That's pretty quick. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but Bill, um, I think, Bill, are you going to come back? Because um, I actually had to sign off. Sorry to be abrupt. Well, do you guys want to keep the conversation going until Bill comes back? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I agree with the uh, like the social was, identity. I'm things sorry, like it was really because... nice to meet you guys and to see you okay, again. Okay, bye. See you, see you again. See you again. Bye. -bye. Hey, Take care. Yeah, Steve, are you signing um, off? No, Steve's here. Oh, good, good. I want to make sure that um, Sam had hey, to go. Sam, I know. You know, you guys are doing a great job. We're listening to you. We're downstairs working, listening, and a lot. Of, you know, a lot of people are listening. The idea is, we're trying to be up every Sunday. And I, hopefully people listen like radio. So yeah, yeah. There's Nick's back. Hey, for Nick, I want to record a little bit of Nick. He was gone. I want to do it now. And Steve, uh, Tom, that was excellent. Hey, I, I wanted to record you. I put down. You talked about social media's effects. Yeah, I could see Bernie Sanders coming on the show someday. Yeah, the the viral. Uh, yes, that, that is, that is a good idea. idea. No, I could see him coming. My experience is, I went to a, a Bernie Sanders rally here, and I went. Try to go to a Hillary Clinton rally. First of all, I'm a Republican. I'm, I try to stay nonpartisan because of the media stuff. But um, I'm a I'm a decorated veteran, and they had a veterans event for Hillary Clinton, and I couldn't get into it. It was so controlled, and they only had about maybe 50 to 70 veterans and about 50, maybe 100 supporters of Hillary. And then Bernie Clinton, I, Bernie Sanders had one <laughs> months Clinton's later, good. and they had 4,500 people and jammed outside. It was great. Huh. So I think there's something wrong with the polls out there. <laughs> you think? <laughs> but honestly, I, Tom, you, said it really, you said it well. And I think they're underestimating. The, first of all, the younger vote will always come out in presidential elections. Well, with Reddit, I mean, we have these things. Uh, are any of you guys Redditors by any chance? I know of Reddit. That you should no. check it out um, because Reddit is just a huge social media platform that only is driven by forums and threads. So it's all... I mean, it's got pictures, it's got your dirty sections, like everything else, but it's yeah. basically the world. <laughs> but it's got all of these threads, and they can do these things called uh, AMA, which is a Ask Me Anything. Um, they had Clinton on there doing an AMA. They've had Al Gore with an AMA. Yeah. They they have very, very high-profile people that they're allowed to do AMAs with. So they could do – I don't even know. Let's see. They may have already done um, – let me see. Reddit, Bernie Sanders, AMA. Um, they may have already had a uh, – AMA for Bernie Sanders, but I mean, this would be a good way if you could uh, go on to Reddit would be a good way to bring him back here and show him our blab and then teach him about uh, yeah. yeah how to how to have face to face with people. We, we we have our own Bernie. Have you heard of uh, Jeremy Corbyn? What's that? Yes. What's the yes. name? Jer Corbyn. Jeremy he is the Corbyn. new. He is the leader of the Labour Party, so he is the equivalent okay. of. If, if if he got the job, you know, instead of Hillary, <laughs> if you like. I'm going to grab a cup of coffee. Be right back. Um, um, oh, here he, we go. Is, he, he did do an AMA. Sorry, I'm going to post this up, but you keep talking. Yeah. Um, 
all of the press except two except one maybe two newspapers are absolutely against him he's you know he's too uh, against more bombing of syria he's against uh, replacing trident missiles he's uh, asks intelligent questions instead of shouting at the prime minister prime minister's questions times he's, he's shaken them up and uh, in one breath they're saying it's great because he'll be a disaster and there's no way he will defeat uh, the conservatives at the next general election and at the other hand they're, they're saying actually he's, he might get quite popular because this is intelligent stuff and he might win so they, they don't really know what to do with him but he's he's the british equivalent of, of your bernie but he is already leader of a major political party, the, the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition, it's called. <laughs> <laughs> quick quick uh, point, I just dropped a link in there. And on this link, I we have a site called meetthevoter.com. And I've got to rebuild that site because it loaded bad. We were testing some uh, systems to load the website fast. And it's a bloated website, and i got to really build it from the grassroots up. Who is but, Elon Musk? I hate to ask this, but one but, of the guys that I work with was going to have him on our, our show because wow. we do a blab at the Microsoft store. Who is, he is one of the Wow, the he's I'm in, I'm in Rio, Nevada. I live under he's one a of the greatest innovators the planet's ever seen. He uh, came up with Tesla and he runs SpaceX. He, and he is one of the most amazing human beings that you'd ever yeah. want to meet. I'm going and to YouTube. Research him, Stephen or Tom. Research, I'll, research I'll, I'll Elon I'll Musk. He's an incredible inventor, uh, entrepreneur. And he, um, he he it just invented a battery that uh, oh it's the size of a refrigerator and with a couple of solar panels you'll be off the grid forever and it can power everything it can power a huge house. He, that, yeah. um, Elon Musk is a brilliant brilliant human and SpaceX is what's taking. Uh, yeah, I remember SpaceX. I've, I've been seeing that everywhere. Yeah, you know they're they're uh, it's a commercial non governmental uh, space program. Right, they're trying to do like space tourism, right? For that would be one of the things, yeah, and ex space exploration, and on and on and on. So, yeah, if you have a chance to get next to Elon, that would be wonderful. But he's a really busy man. It's I funny. Would totally Elon end up picking his brain because I'm I'm a like what I do is I, I do independent consulting. I find people's products, things like that, and I give them ideas to make their product better. I mean, I do it with any platform. I have engineers I work with and people that are like trying to design things to make. Uh, certain areas better and I'm always uh, my brain's very all over the place so I'm able to pull things together from th like places people don't think of we'll join this, this hey can I, I want to take a break group. for a second I just put a link into a schedule I don't have the um, what I'd like to do is I'm trying to get a list of maybe 10 or 20 guest people to come on this show early on but since I don't have the link for the form built I put in a link from one of our podcasts that's our interview link and both of you, by the way, qualify for that interview. We're just backed up on interviews right now. Um, but if you go to that podcaster's home forward slash schedule um, and just fill out whatever you feel like filling out so we can contact you, specifically your email and your point of contact as much as you want, I'll get you guys uh, lined up to be a, a guest on the early part of the show and bring you on. The that other thing, Nick, you're gone, but uh, Bernie Sanders, I think, could be on the show if we worked at it. I mean, he the, the, and I would just be a, a neutral moderator to have you and one other person on with him but i think it would be very valuable for him to come on as it grows and we had a thousand people last week watching one time and he can come on anytime sunday because we open it up hey i gotta go i gotta go and finish a project right now it's actually my daughter with her printing out something on Susie's computer so i'll be right back and nick i'd like to um and both of you welcome i'd like to record a couple minutes of this conversation and we'd like to get your short-term and long-term forecasts the long-term shouldn't be changing I'll let you guys go on. You, great show. I'm interrupting right now. Thanks, Bill. So I'll be back. I'm going to actually shut up if somebody wants to. Does he, does he want just to say what you said before? Because he was recording. I didn't quite catch that. No, let me, let me come back real fast. <laughs> I'd like to record what Tom said early, very early on in the process about the, the social media era. revolution. You want to do that right now? Let me ask you a question. Let's figure out the question. You guys can help me. So, Tom, welcome welcome on to Meet the Voter. You're the younger voter, represent the younger voter. In about three or four minutes, could you explain how you feel social media is going to affect, I'm rehearsing right now, by the way, affect, you know, the outcome of the elections this year? I'm going to ask that question, okay? Uh, you all continue. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I'm thinking of my answers, too. Okay, you can wait a second and relax, and I'll ask that. Then I've got to go finish a project for my daughter. We're actually downstairs, have a computer up and a, an iPad up. We're actually listening to the show down there. 
And I think if we stay on every Sunday doing this, that eventually people will listen like radio on Sunday. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it'd be a great idea. Blab for me has been kind of addictive because, yeah. like, I, I started it with my my guy who was helping me with my own business and my own branding, actually. Um, and I started blabbing it uh, at the Microsoft Store here in uh, Seattle and Bellevue. Uh -huh. And when I started, I was like, "Oh, this is just blab. It looks kind of boring. There's nothing to do here." But then I thought, like, two two three days ago, I met a guy who was like I was saying, who was doing a, a product, and he was trying to find out. He's like, "Okay, I have this product. I want you to look at it and give me some ideas and some insights." And uh, like I'm, I'm like a, a school kid. Like as soon as he gave yeah. me, like showed me the product, and he was like, "Give me, give me something to help me with this." I just, I, I kind of blew up. I'm like, "Oh, let me help you!" And I, I gave him all these new ideas. And now he's like following me, and he's like, "This was great. I love your input." And then he led me to another guy, and uh, so now I'm seeing the power of Blab. So I've been trying hey, to do this way for uh, every every at least hour a day. Yeah. So yeah, that's good, Tom. Uh, FYI, just just a thought: we do net casting. We create. We're going to create a podcast out of part of this as well as okay. YouTube. So it goes on YouTube, podcasting, netcasting, as well as a blog. We put everything together. It reduces our iTunes numbers a little bit, but uh, we have the, we've had the top in the top seven, we're rated top seven in WordPress uh, shows. We have, I have five shows that I'm a part of, and one of them is one of the top shows in the, in WordPress. Well, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go into your Twitter real quick and follow you there as well. Okay. Yeah. And I've followed you, but go ahead. I'm going to ask you this question. And Thanks, I'm, gonna, Tom. I'm going to shut down the seat while I ask the question. And we'll open it back up. Okay. And Nick, you're there if you want to follow up. Yeah, Nick, I'm following you. And I, I want to keep this at less than five minutes on this one. So we're going to record. Ready for I'm going to ask you. Here we go. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, I'm excited. I actually get to go see my son this Christmas. I haven't seen him in two years. So it'll be very interesting. How old is your son? He's four. Uh, he uh, almost shared my birthday. So he, he was born on the 19th of January. And my birthday is the 30th. So is this in Vietnam? No, he's in uh, South Carolina. Um, okay. Where? With a, with a, but me and her are on good terms. So Great. It's for him. I mean, I, I, the way I look at it as a parent, I do not want to fight in front of him, and I don't want him to ever think his parents don't like each other. He needs to have a as whole of a childhood as they can. So, I mean, parents, they get along with each other That's is very key to that. My ex-wife and I have raised our son and grandson and – we're best of friends and always have been. So yeah, that's a good way. Well, there's no gain out of fighting. You don't you don't win anything. You don't you don't gain anything. It's a very limited view, and if anything, you you create a divide. And divides aren't useful. They don't help anybody. Yep. They can help people overcome things, yeah. But you don't need to overcome something. I'd rather you know work with him together than apart. Um, but yeah. Well, it's great to have you on board, and uh, hopefully we'll. Uh, see more of you with these our podcasts here because yeah. you know what this is like number six right and when we started it was six people on day one and it's now we've last to 20 it's pretty good of course the paris thing had just happened but um you wouldn't believe the people that came on last week it was amazing really mm -hmm. and it's been growing exponentially so um we we will continue this you know we've got 350 this week so even if you discount what happened because of Paris last week, we've gone from six to 350, over 350, and uh, it's going to continue growing. I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I like that. We had, we had a thousand last like week, hundred almost 200 people watched it after the fact, and on YouTube, without any marketing or any area, we got close to 100. We put it up on iTunes. I'm putting up iTunes one, I put it up on a show we have called uh, Timelines, which is interviews just to test it. We're going to put it up today and another one called Politics of Success just to test it. But next week, it'll have its own channel, I think. Yeah, I like that. So yeah, I like that, Bill. Politics of Success. That's a new one, huh? Yeah, that, no, that's been around for a long time. That was one of our early test ones. The yeah. idea was to talk Pretty to good. political consultants to find out um, what they thought of the best ways to get elected, actually. Mm -hmm. So and I have a stupid Democrats question. Were, huh? I, I feel this is a stupid question. I know because they teach us this in, in – in high school and history and politics and all that, but why, what, what's the point to having a divided uh, voting situation? Like why is there the Democrats and why is it Republics? Republicans. Because I, Republicans, I don't, I don't feel like, like I feel like <laughs> most Democrats and most Republicans have beliefs that are crossed, like they blend. So what pigeonholes them into being a Democrat and pigeonholes them into being Repu like Republican. I would say the one defining site was the concept and among most Republicans. And I think Democrats 
is that Republicans believe that government should be limited, only do those things we cannot best do ourselves. And they think that government is inherently inefficient. And we're really rail, a Republican's going to rail against crony capitalism. And right. we're, we're afraid of crony capitalism. I mean, a lot of folks, as much as anything. I was elected to city council and vice mayor of a fairly large city of Modesto before 9-11. And it's really interesting. What I found is once I got elected and I came up through the building industry, is the people really who were in power didn't have a philosophy one way or the other. It was what was best for them. And it was right. called special interests. So Agreed. I really started changing my perspective there. And I think what you've seen in the last 20 years, when we talked about this earlier in the show, was that the middle is controlled by the same people. And that's what you have. There's little differences, but not huge differences in the middle. It's when you get to the right and the left where that starts changing. Now, Tom, from what I see to, to answer your question is that it was it's come about uh, in order to control the masses. I don't think there's really any <laughs> benefit. Parties? But controlling doesn't. I don't think there's any benefit to it. I, I don't see it. I don't see it at all. I, I, I look at things. Control. I guess I'm a little naive in my my worldview because I don't understand what's the point of controlling things because when i look at control i think of like okay i drink soda right i like a bottle of coke every now and then you put a lid on it to keep it inside that's control why not just take the lid off and let people progress and expand and actually pursue the interests of like the the greater good but i guess you know it all has a lot to do with who grand the, idea but of course the, the greater good would centers be. don't want that you know, ben, ben franklin idea. said um during the early days he said and this is well documented that government is like fire when it's controlled it can serve us and help us and do great things but when it jumps out and becomes too big it it, it can destroy us yeah that's exactly that's the, what i think happened. most at least that's what i lean towards is government you need some government but inherently it's inefficient it wastes a lot of money but the worst thing i think is crony capitalism that's where you get government and 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 business together controlling like when business you were talking earlier about the corporations controlling government that's that's a that's a fear of everyone's it's well, already they, happening they though do. yeah that's and, and that's the problem and then we and the, when uh sam early earlier asked us you know what a political revolution is well there's that's a complex question you know that's the, the, there's a, a you know a, a plethora of answers that are all appropriate but one of them is to get the money out just get the money out so that the people's voices, individuals, so every every voter, no matter how wealthy or how uh, poor, that their vote counts equally. And that's called democracy. But we don't get that because minds are controlled and minds are controlled through control of the media. Which is but, funny because I never I, I didn't do a lot of the media that I think that's the reason why I'm, I'm I have a different thought process than most people's because when I was growing up. I was, I, like I said, with the bad parents things, my parents locked me in my room. They were always upset with me. Like I, I aced all my tests in school. I never did my homework. And by third grade, I was reading Michael Crichton and Stephen King. And I was knocking these novels out like every week, every week that went by, I was moving on to a new novel. And like Michael Crichton for a third grader, I think is, is a little intense. So, I mean, my, my view was all based off of the books I read and the fact that I never watched TV. I didn't have a chance to sit there and veg for hours on end. I was just always reading something so that might have changed my my, my media input because writers aren't controlled nearly as much as is our television fortunately like someone doesn't go through and like weed through and be like oh well i don't like this and fortunately stephen king has a lot of political dissent <laughs> well, he, is, he just doesn't like it so this blab pap form is allowing us to do something that's never been done before as far as i can see we're competing against uh, TV. About two years ago, I started a project to try to create a way to create local media, basically a male and female reporter going out, doing the, the news during the day, bringing it back, editing it, and then putting it in a live feed, either on RSS feed through iTunes or other elements. So you can just watch it on your phone. And I do believe that's coming someday. It's not quite there. But the big media is definitely starting to um, have issues. I went to the National Broadcasters Association forum, had a VIP ticket. They they gave me a free thousand dollar ticket. It's kind of neat. Got to go to all the parties and meals and saw the really wealthy folks in that in, in industry. It's still a lot of money in that industry, but uh, it's going to change. They're in for awakening. If you haven't seen it, newspapers have died already. Most newspapers. I see a lot of. I've been in Seattle and like the newspapers here are all shifting. Like because Seattle's uh, demographic yeah. isn't isn't Caucasian anymore. Like you, you see 
um, mostly Asian. It's mostly Chinese um, and Southeast Asian. So like a, a large, heavy part of our population now, we, we've got like China Daily. It's not just the, the regular newspaper. So we're all, we're adopting different media and different cultures so well print like, media is just too expensive uh, it's, it's, it's too expensive here. it kills trees and people are starting to frown on that um i mean and and, and, and the, it's all about advertising dollars if people don't get a, a return for their advertising dollars they're not going to go there i see in the future people carrying around uh, have you seen the oled um it's like the the sheet it's basically like a tv screen that's a flat sheet and you yeah. can hold it out and if that was a magazine i mean all you could do is like say you walk up to uh it will look like a newsstand but it'll probably be shaped more like uh maybe like a pay toll booth for like uh, when you park your car or whatever or maybe they'll actually make it look like the old newsstand with like a usb slot and then you put your 25 cents in you plug in your usb slot to your uh, your oled and then you could just download the news onto your oled platform right. and then continue to walk well, you, you guys have um tablets and microsoft i mean apple has the ipad yeah and you drop that, that and it shatters phone. and it gets stolen but i like the oled just because if it gets wet it's not going to break um right. if you drop it it's just going to bounce i mean you can hold it you can fold it up it could be it could be basically about as thick as a rolled up magazine you just carry the right around in your in your pocket but it'll just be a tube with two little buttons and you just slide them out and that would be fun. That would be like very futuristic, but I, I've seen that those images, they've been able to do some of that already and you roll it up, and, but I don't know all the mechanics behind it, but I'm just saying things are changing. This <laughs> online uh, streaming environment that we're in right now didn't exist a year ago. No, not at all. This We've is new. Doing- I, I hate to see what they do with beta. Like when it switches over to like uh, it's actual platform. So I don't know how they're going to monitor it and, uh, basically make it for the masses so they say there's still some problems i'd like to really keep this show open not today but in the future maybe seven or eight hours or at a time from sunday morning and then bring on a couple other folks to um moderate and hold it open and talk and have different opinions and i do think eventually we could schedule in some higher end people like bernie sanders i think bernie might be one that might do it i'm surprised that no politicians that i know have really jumped on the bandwagon yet in this on this just think Bernie could be doing a show every week and talking to folks live on here. And he'd get a huge number. Well, I think he's fairly busy. <laughs> no, I mean, but you can do that from wherever. You can do that. You could pre-record it. You could have some of his spokesmen come up. You could have him come up. He's definitely busy, but you can reach a lot of people really fast by doing this kind of media. And plus, it's recorded. Here's the one thing about politicians. And I, I actually sort of worked in – I got elected a few times and won some primaries. But politicians – it's a two-edged sword, the social media. They can get tripped up very fast by saying something stupid, and then it's repeated. Now, Trump is is like <laughs> – they were talking – earlier we were talking about something that uh, Frank uh, Falkenhoff – I forgot his name is a, a prominent Republican – was talking about. And he said all these rules are being broken. Normally, if you said the things that Trump said, you'd be in the, in the tubes right now, but you're not. Well, there, there is so much uh- – parody now from the things that trump has said that it's it's hilarious i just i i don't understand how and why he decided to run for for president because the things he said is just reminds me of the the people i've met in the south well, there was a poll <laughs> just, done just uh that i just saw today um uh an unbiased you know not one side or the other and it they did a comparison of bernie running against trump and they showed that it was 56% Bernie, 44% uh, Trump, if, the, if they were the candidates. Now, that's an epic a win. That's like a huge, huge right. gap. And I believe that's about what's going to happen with whoever the Republicans bring up. Hey, uh, Tom, you, al- you also mentioned Hillary's problem with the FBI actually investigating right now. If you listen to this show, and at the end of it, we get forecasts, the, the, the panel members. And I have a long term and short term. My long term has always been consistent is that this FBI investigation, no matter how it turns out, is really going to affect her campaign because either the director of the FBI will recommend that she be indicted or a non recommendation, but all the information will become public. And I used to work in that business. Um, I was a reserve at 30 years active in reserve and worked in Afghanistan quite a bit, had a, a very high level security clearance, worked between the State Department and the military. I'd love to do that, actually. And you can't really – well, you can do that. Uh, DIA work, you know, you're the age where you can get into that business. Somebody actually uh, – they said if, we're, if I wanted to be a uh, – if I wanted to get into uh, the FBI, I had to have a college degree, though. 
Well, Bill yeah, is a West Point graduate, so yeah, you might yeah. want to have a background like that. <laughs> yeah, well, I could go to the military. The military, if I if I sign up for the any of them, the Army, the Marines, my my GT score, I guess, was like a one thirty five. Go um, for intelligence. I mean, that's, that's what like, they want me for. They said we if intel. we hire you, you'll either be military intelligence or special forces. So we, we had someone come on. By the way, out of special forces when I was young, and I still was later on and on different programs. But they, um, the way you do go into intelligence and you work up, I just was talking, and you can get your degree through the military. There's yeah, yeah. That's why I liked it because the military offers me housing, food, money, and college. <laughs> I work. I, I, you get a little burnout in the intelligence environment because you're in cells and skiffs, and yeah, you, there's different, all sorts of different types of intelligence. I want to talk about it here. A way yeah, you yeah, yeah. Collect information and understand certain things you do. But, um, you, you're welcome to come on and just I put that link. I've got to get people to sign up on the link. I need to know their emails, information about you. Yeah, I'm like filling it out right now. Sam, I think Sam's uh, timeline is going to come up this week, later on this week. It should be up by next week. We got, and you know, we're big Mac. We're sort of Mac people here too. Uh, Nick is on a PC right now this time, right? Yep. And uh, half the time you're on Mac. I'm PCing it. I like, I like both. You have to. You work for Microsoft. <laughs> sort of. The Surface, yeah. right? The Surface. You gotta yeah, use the Surface. I'm, I'm third party, but we've uh, we've done a lot of uh, stuff with the Surface. The Surface is a great platform to use the Blab yeah. on. So. I I came very close. I was trying to make a decision after 20 some odd years. I'm a design build company in the military working with PCs. I uh, Two years ago, I went over and really worked hard at developing my um, skills on the Mac. And I do like Mac for what we're doing here as well for design. Um, I think for CAD and some other applications, the PC is better. But there's you need, you, what's nice about the uh, Mac is the computer just works well with these environments, all the drivers. They make really high-quality hardware. And with Mac, um, I was coming from my, my perspective before I used to do um, – I was pursuing my degrees in game design, and the Mac is perfect for things like that because if you're trying to design things in a 3D environment, the, the Mac, because it's not um, so focused on using the operating system to take up all the RAM like PC tends to, yeah. um, it, it just is great because you can render all your environments, you can do your graphics, all of that, and the Mac's just like, yeah, this is fine. I'll take care of this. <laughs> So. Yeah, they, they do. There's a lot of shortcuts that it's kind of complex. And I work a lot on WordPress, too. And I'm not a guru in any of these things, but I'm around people who are very smart. We interview um, our WP Tonic. We talk to the very top people across the world on, on WordPress. And uh, we just had this month on learning management systems and all the new things that are evolving. But um, I'd like to keep this up. Anybody else want to come up? Nick, do you have a forecast? I want to work forecast with you guys and record those. So, what do you uh, have for what Question do you have for, for forecast, short term, long term, Nick? And we, I want to keep. I'm gonna actually ask people to fill this out each week. I'm gonna send it out. There's Jonathan. Yay, Jonathan's Hello. back. Hey, Jonathan. Hello. Hello. Jonathan, I was gonna ask Nick for a short term, long term conference question. Yeah, I'm gonna give you some chance to think about this. Got to be concise, short. John, Jonathan gave his. What was yours, Jonathan? I've got it recorded. It's in my book downstairs. Oops. I think um, I think Bernie is gonna become. That's right. You had Bernie. Bernie's going to uh, win. And Trump's going to be there. That's your two uh, long term. Trump's going to do it, mate. I think Trump's going to be the Republican candidate. Uh, I think Bernie might get it on the Democrat side because I think Hillary's going to get in trouble. But Nick, I want you to come up with a short term and long term, and it's about to get succinct. So, what do you think on? on then I'm going to record you. What do you think on uh, short term? Well, on the short term, I think it was amazing that a Republican state like Louisiana just by a landslide, voted in a Democrat. Now, Bob B. Jindal is the governor there now. Did they have an election? I missed that one. Yes, they did. And a Republican who was favored, heavily favored, but towards the end, he came up, there was a uh, a scandal about prostitution uh, with a Republican. I and remember that. The, that was... the Republicans jumped team. They jumped the sides and they went for the Democrat who vowed on day one to sign an executive order allowing 225,000 of the poorest Louisiana people to access Obamacare because Jindal had blocked it. So I think that is telling in, a, in an amazing way about what's huh. going to happen and quickly. I think this, the tide is turning. That was I was so grateful and, 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 wow. and elated to see that uh, earlier today. I'm looking at the story right now. It's amazing. Meet the Press didn't have anything on anything. Of course they're not. Meet the Press was that. so bad today. 
Meet They're the not going to do that, but that's what. But the, we are seeing it. You're seeing it, and the social media is seeing it. And it's it's gonna the, it, on a, on a short term. It's gonna the groundswell is gonna just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then of course, long term, I do believe that as I've said before, Bernie's gonna get it. Bernie's gonna win by a landslide, and it will have a major and beautiful effect okay, okay, on Nick, our world. Let's look at short term. I'm going to ask you those questions and record. So again, what was your short term? The short term is that the groundswell for Bernie is going to change because of the uh, election in Louisiana, that the a, a Republican state that overwhelmingly by a landslide mm-hmm. voted for a Democrat because they so, jumped ship. And so I don't blame them. If I were a, Demo- or a Republican, yeah. I would have jumped ship a while back. I don't think anybody questions that Bernie Sanders is not an, an honorable person. They may disagree with his um, socialist views, but that's one thing he's got going for him that others don't. Mm-hmm. Hey, I'm going to record that. I'm going to ask you, Nick. Okay, ready? Here, I'm going to go. It'll be just, I'm going to I'm going to get off of here. So, yeah, make- yeah. If you guys need me to go at any point, let me know. I'll probably be going to karaoke with friends today. <laughs> oh, awesome! Teaching well, a girl I some karaoke, reading. Lessons. I was in China. And oh, really? it's hilarious because they, they it's so popular over there and they sing in Mandarin and they sing in English. And uh, the, where I was, they couldn't sing very well, but boy, did they have a great time. <laughs> <laughs> it was really funny. And they were just really having a blast. That's actually getting really popular here. Um, in, in Seattle, I've noticed more than anywhere else because I haven't seen karaoke rooms like this. Like their, their rooms just centrally focused on karaoke and that's it yeah, like you china, go in across china they've got ktv rooms they call them yeah there's couches and there's like a karaoke uh, machine and things like that and you just have people come in and cater to you it's not like uh like when i lived back back east it was a, a bar you go to and somebody had like a an amp and a, a microphone and you sang to the crowd but here it's different you know you just go into their little room and you have your your singing with your friends that's how it is in china yeah, yeah i like it it's a very personal experience Okay. And uh, by the way, now that I did mention China, I will tell you, I've been there twice. And just about everything you see on the mainstream media is a lie. That th- Those people are amazing. They're more honest. They're more uh, united. They're happier than the people in the United States. I went to a lot of places where I was the only Westerner and I was always protected. I was always treated with great kindness and compassion so i saw that, churches everywhere i saw synagogues and 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 i asked about these labor camps that you know we hear so much about and they looked at me like what no that's a long time ago i saw many families with many many children and so so the image that the mainstream media has portrayed at least in the united states is completely warped so we're slandering the chinese population in order to prevent americans from actually wanting to go to china would you say that? I don't know what the reasons are. There's a definite fear campaign going on because, I mean, all of the information I've seen about going to China has been bad information. Yeah, well, uh, talk to the people that have been there. And I have, and I've talked to many people that have been there. And it's not anything. You know, I saw police everywhere. Everywhere. I never saw a gun. Ever. One out of 20 of them had a stick. And that's it. Huh. You know, and I, it, it's a completely, you know, they have what's called face. It's an honor system. And when they find somebody that's cheating or, you know, uh, they, it, it's like um, o- water and oil. They just won't do business with them. They just won't have any communication with them. They won't talk to them. And uh, they, I, I was never cheated. I don't speak any Chinese other than hello and I love you, you know. And the uh, I was never cheated out of a penny, and they, they took great care to make sure that I was fine. And you know why? I, I don't. You know, I'm just another American. I happen to be a sculptor. Oh, Tom, did you leave? Um. Okay, if it's just me, I guess uh, we're about done. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, yeah, I, I you never cheated. They treated China you goes, you know, um, you really need to do some research and talk to the people that have been there. 
I've been trying to do business with China actually because I want to set up a. Uh, I have a lot of friends who have great ideas and they they have a product that they want to create, and I know that China has cheaper manufacturing costs. And a lot of people are like, "Oh, don't use China for cheaper manufacturing costs. It's unethical." Blah blah blah. And I'm just like, "Why? It's not like I'm screwing these Chinese people over. If I make enough money and I have a factory out there, I'll give them comparative wages to what we make out here." I know many people that have factories there, and you know what they do? They make a bunch of money, come back here, and hire a lot of people to uh, help them with their businesses. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Uh, if I made enough money and they wanted, if they wanted to be American citizens, things like that, then I would I would strive to actually helping them out with that as well. I mean, millions of them are. They're, they they make their money and then they leave China. You know, it, like China's not perfect. You know, the pollution is terrible, and um, the the they uh, have too many people. Like most governments, so many governments are just terrible. I think our government is so so terrible on so many levels because of the corporate rule, because of the. Uh, uh, you know, rigged elections and, the, and a rigged Wall Street, uh, but their government is just as bad. I think our government is the are great. Is the the best of the worst, though, in, in some aspects. No, actually, no, not anymore. I used to think it was the best of the worst until um, I started paying more attention to like uh, Sweden <laughs> and those countries. They're they're amazing. Like um, I think it's Sweden that like every citizen has has a gun, um, but they're taught from like childhood on how to use it, how to respect it and how to defend themselves without being crazy. And there's rarely and any care, which it really comes in handy when you've got a, a, an armed populace. Yeah. When mental health care and free schooling. And w look what happens. You know how many people get killed a day here in the United States, Tom? Nine, Six. nine, zero point four one, nine, almost nine, ninety point four one people are killed every day with household guns. So when we talk about, um, you there know, you go, yeah. tragedies, that, you know, it, it's like 33, almost 32,500 people, look it up, are killed every year in this country. It comes to about 90, a little over 90 a day. Now that's a travesty. That's, it is. Um, yeah. And I think a, a lot of people, the, the, this day and age, the reason that there's so much violence and gun crime and death is just the pressure that's being put onto people. Like people can't handle it. There's, it's like, we're, we're given all of the resources in the world to succeed, but we're not being shown how to use them. And the ones who, who have had that training and who have had all of that background and people like basically coddling them into their success, these people pretty much throw it into the, the poor spaces. And they're like, look, this is what I've done. I've done better than you. And then they turn into very narcissistic people. I mean, if I were in that position and I would, I'd grown and I'd have all of that money and success, I would find these people that are like – cracking and breaking and needing that help and i'd like to be able to raise them up and make them a better whole person if that was something i had the uh the resources and the the money for it, it's i'm working towards it but that's 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 the way i view it i think more people need people helping each other out our community is is crap right now we don't have community not like it was like 40 years ago people were i think were a lot more connected back then and now that we've become now that we've become more digitally connected and able to reach out to people with like the stroke of a keyboard, we've become that much more disconnected. Well, you know, I've spent the last uh, 47 years, something like that in Laguna Beach, California. Mm -hmm. And it's a small town in a, in a big Southern California. And we do have a sense of community. It's really strong. And I think that that is what's lacking. You know, I go to other areas and everybody is isolated. You know, neighbors don't talk to each other. You know, um, in Laguna, we do. And we have, and we take care of our homeless. We take care of each other. Fundraisers are, you know, anytime people need help in Laguna, there's a, po a fundraiser pops up. My son is a, a famous musician. And I don't know, you know, it would be in the hundreds uh, of, of free performances he's done, he and his, his crew, uh, for fundraisers. And, you know, the... the the world we need that we need more of that community sense of community tom i agree with you 100 percent there because it works yeah that's what i'm trying to create i want a sense of community i want to be able to you know i'm, I'm ambitious i want to be the head of the community of course but i i want to i want to be in the center of that you know i want to have this whole community and these people just that i can bring together enough well i mean i'm just saying was for me it's just the deciding factors of being able to I mean, community is great, but I also want to have direction. I want to have a f somewhat of a focus. Like, I want all of these people to be able to collaborate and create something great instead of, 
you know, being left down in the, in the, in the, in the past. I want everyone to be able to raise up and keep going. Cause I, I've lived a really difficult life. Um, I, my parents, my mom was a meth addict. My dad wasn't around. He, he was sort of, but I mean, I, I know what it's like to be homeless. I know what it's like to beg for food, go hungry, be abandoned, have like my parents say, Oh, Hey, we're going to visit the the babysitter. But the babysitter was just this lady that we were being dropped off for, for like three weeks at a time. So I've been through all of that and I'm, I'm still going and I'm still striving to do something greater. And I want to be able to share that with people. I want to be able to bring people out of their, their dark place, basically. Well, I uh, hope you'll remain with us and Bill. Bill is at the forefront of this technology and it's growing. It's growing beautifully. And we will have, a, I, I didn't get a chance to mention this to Bill, but I'm sure he's listening. Yeah. Uh, in, in Concerning Bernie, I have a relationship now with the head of the California campaign for Bernie. Nice. And the, the, he is a transplant from the East Coast who has been working uh, politically for progressives for decades. So uh, there's a strong chance I can get him to come on. And he has a direct line to Bernie. So I'm going to pursue that <laughs> and see Bill, if on there's that a one. possibility that we can work. At, you know, Bill, you gave me that idea. Did you hear what I just said, Bill? I heard a little bit about Bernie. I think it's very much a possibility. It would be you and, and one other selectee. To the interview, I just help run the backside. Well, I was at a, a Bernie event about a week ago, and uh, the the head of the the campaign, one of the prominent members of the campaign, who has transplanted himself to California to to help run the California campaign for Bernie, uh, he and I developed a relationship, and so I will now uh, connect with him, Bill, and try and get him here because he's here and he's available, you know, he's yeah, in he comes through. I'm sure he comes through. But, you know, and I, I do work with the uh, democratic party of Orange County and mm -hmm. I am uh, on the board of directors of the Laguna beach democratic club. Yeah. And um, because of that, I have connections that I, I you know, I, I can communicate with these folks. So I'll try and get somebody on in, in the next week or two. Yeah. And well, I have a the they time. would like to come on and he has a direct voice to Bernie. It'd be nice to find someone up here in Reno who is connected in with a party too. Maybe get you and him on both interviewing Bernie. That would be good. Um, is there a good time, Bill, to uh, Euro, Euro, guess who's on? Hey, Euro, to schedule a uh, uh, the the podcast. Hey there, guys. We got, he's, this guy's famous. We got Euro on from France. Sorry, go ahead, Tom. I was saying, is is there a good time to schedule for your podcast? Uh, it says on the twenty sixth, right? Yeah, I do it on every Thursday. We do interviews. Hey, Euro, thank you for coming on. Hey guys, how are you guys? Good. Good. I really enjoyed the cat. I re I really enjoyed the blab last week. Hey, yeah, that was, was great. Right front. Hey, you're, you know, go to iTunes. Check out iTunes. Oh, you can go to iTunes. Go to you blabcast. I mean, you blab. Go go to uh, um, meetthevoter dot com. The iTunes feeds right in the top. Okay, cool. And you're also on. Uh, so if, I, you go, if you go search, you're actually on timelines. If you go to Bill Conrad and iTunes, you'll find it at Timelines, your episode. It's a special episode, like 05, 005. Okay, I'll have to check it out. It came out really good. We put you right actually up at the front of the iTunes clip. Oh, um, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. So we're trying to – I'm trying to keep this with sponsors, people running for about four or five hours on Sunday so people can listen around their nice. uh, computer or in their kitchen. I was just cooking food downstairs while – Nick was handling everything. We got Tom on, who's a from Seattle, or not Seattle, but from um, near our Seattle, up near Microsoft Land, and uh, close. Yeah, to short line, but ba basically, I'm I'm near Seattle. Bellevue is That's actually. Good. What, just what are you? Uh, uh, what are you? What are we seeing, Euro? This is nothing. This is this is uh yeah. This is like uh, out in the <laughs> sticks in the Paris suburbs. You're always out in the uh, sticks last week. I was last time too. Yeah, because it was around the same time. I usually come here uh, on the weekends just to get away from the city because I'm uh, in in concrete uh, city all all week long. So what time GoPro? is it there? It is. Let's see. What time is it? I don't even know. You have to check on your phone. It's hard to do. <laughs> it is hard to do actually because when I swipe yeah. down, you don't want to swipe up. Uh, hey, Euro. Yeah, I think exactly. what I'd like to do is take advantage of having you there. And like it's six hours ahead of New York, whatever that is. Yeah, you want to give us an update? It, it's um, nine hours ahead of us, so one, so it's pretty late there. It's uh, I'm nine hours ahead of the Pacific Coast and six hours ahead of the East Coast. Yeah, so it's so almost it's two, so it's like 
Uh, 11 o'clock at night, 11 p.m., 2300. Hey, you're Yeah, so that's not so bad. Yeah. I'd like to get a good recording. Why, can you give us an update of what happened in Paris this week? I'll, I'm not recording yet. I'll go ahead and record you. Well, I'm, sure. I mean, well, I, listen, I mean so much you. happened. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what part you want to know. But I did, I did do a lot of uh, – I, did, I, did, I got a few uh, breaking news scopes uh, where I was the first to report on things, which okay, was pretty Okay, why don't you tell us about those? I'm going to put you on for about five minutes, so – and then you can continue on after that. We'd love to have you on for a while. Well, we have Euro Mas Mas I can't say it right. Maestro. 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 Euro Maestro. I need to start that one again, but it'll be on the uh, YouTube for sure. We have Euro <laughs> okay, Maestro cool. on from coming in from France. It's late there. It's twenty three hundred. I want him to give us an update of what's happened this week, and specifically some of the breaking news. Okay. Well, let's try to see. Uh, I, I, it's hard to remember all the things that happened, but I guess the big item I think was the siege on Wednesday. Where they had uh, they got some intelligence to suggest that the ringleader, which uh, everybody's been calling the mastermind, some people don't like it when I call him the mastermind, but the uh, ringleader of the events was uh, back in uh, Paris. So uh, they had some reason to suspect this particular apartment uh, in this apartment building. So they did a raid. I uh, was started at four sixteen in the morning. Yeah, I saw and, it. Um, so you guys probably saw that it resulted in some deaths, resulted in uh, eight people getting arrested, five police officers getting injured, uh, one police dog getting killed. Uh, so it was, it was and, and it was, you know, this went on for about seven hours. There's just like thousands of rounds of ammunition, grenades, explosions. So, of course, the neighborhood, you know, all the neighbors are freaking out in the neighborhood. And actually, all, all of Paris was probably on edge because nobody... <laughs> Nobody knew what was going on exactly. You know, all, all we know is there's explosions again and fire shots and uh, fires being. Uh, yeah, they said over 5,000 rounds. Over 5,000 rounds. Yeah. You know, something I'm yeah. uh, really suspect about is that, yeah. you know, they said that the, the, the uh, Paris police were completely uh, caught off guard. But the next day, yeah. they, they knew the ringleader. What's up with that? We're just kind of I, uh, well, what do you mean? Because, because you mean you're talking about the Friday night event? No, I'm talking. Yeah, yes, exactly. And the next day, they had the name. They they published the name of who they thought, which is the person you're talking about, the ringleader, the mastermind, however you. Yeah. Know. And and yeah. the next day, they knew that it was him, or at least suspected that it was him. Now that. Well, I'll, I'll, yeah, and that's suspicious to you, is what you're saying, right? Big time. Yeah, well, I think I may actually have some answers for that. Um, a lot of the um, assailants that were um, involved in this were actually known uh, to uh, the police force or to the security forces mm -hmm. or to the intelligence. So a lot of these people I track, they have a thing in France called the S-File. And these are basically people that are um, considered suspects uh, in terms of being radicalized for Islam and potentially dangerous so a lot of these people were uh in one of these files and were being tracked uh these people were also being tracked uh through foreign intelligence particularly uh turkish intelligence there was also we found out um some some isis uh people that had defected uh, defected earlier in the year and who were interrogated who had who had gave information about a, a, an imminent attack coming in, in paris so what happened is basically there was a lot of information that was coming in. Uh, okay. This goes sense. back to September, September, September 11th, um, oddly enough. So uh, do you so think September 11th, that yeah. ISIS has joined up with them then for like it was just like a broken off Great. branch well, of all you. the crap from then? That was a helpful answer. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch that question. I, was I saying, said like, thank you. That was helpful. Oh, sorry. No, that I got. <laughs> Did you mention that this this information has been out since September 11? Would you say that they're just a like a like a little party? Okay, that hey, Bill, off from fellas, them? I have a, a commitment, a previous commitment <laughs> now, and I think my time is just about up. All right, that's okay. Thank you. Didn't think you made it, didn't think you made it in, but you still made it in. Well, thank you. I like that question. I hope I hope you I gave a little bit of an answer to that. Yeah, you did. That was helpful. You know, because I, I, when things like that happen, I get a little worried that maybe, you know, there's this always this notion of false flag things happening, you know. And, and sure, of course. And and the, so so many, you know, as I've researched different developments, you know, I'm I'm still suspicious of nine one one. 
you know, because I was there. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's. A, I was there yeah. two weeks after nine one one, and there's a fire department right. right on, you know, like a, you know, just across the street from Ground Zero. Right. And I was right. walking around, and you know, people were on the fence, wailing, crying. It was, it was like unbelievable experience. It was, oh my god, it chokes me up now to, to think about it. And 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 as I walked past the fire department. The door suddenly opened to the fire, and, and they just pulled out a truck to wash it, you know. But the, as the firemen came out, oh, there's the full moon, a big moon in Paris. Yeah, I wanted to show the moon. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> and they walked out, and it was like a spiritual moment. The people just stopped, and they walked out like like a ceremony, and they had lost half of their fire department, you know. So they were right, and. But then they were talking about the explosions that they heard and how the buildings collapsed and that uh, uh, ordinance had been installed, obviously, before the planes hit. So I know, Bill, that you don't buy that. I know I'm a civil engineer and a degree in training in Air Force. And I know I, I, I was activated at 10 o'clock that day. I saw the buildings come down live I mean, on TV. We all watched it. And, and, and this, I know the structure, what happens, the planes hit them and the heat from the structure failed on the steel and they could they pancake down on the pretty clear what happened but they're talking about explosions yeah, yeah, they, down below yeah but not up high yeah but noises I, all sorts of noises i know yeah, i mean everyone saw no but, no i mean but if you want to talk about that i mean coincidentally i happen to have been at that time working at two world trade center and at seven world trade center wow uh just pro yeah wow. um but uh what he's talking about though is not uh i believe He's not talking about two World Trade Center, which clearly collapsed because of the heat. Um, 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 the other building, the seven buildings that came down. Yeah, yeah, d destabilizing the the uh, the structure there. No, but it, it's it's the seven World Trade Center, which the the conspiracy uh, theorists are worried about, because seven wasn't impacted at all, of course, uh, by the planes. And it came down, and some people are suspicious that it was some kind of controlled explosion. And then yeah. you have the recording from the uh, from the owner saying something like "pull it," <laughs> and uh, so people, you know, people Which got also, got worried about that. Of the uh, of a, of a BBC reporter standing in front of the building reporting that it had collapsed before it collapsed. How does that? Yeah, that's happen? true. Yeah, that's twenty to How thirty minutes happen? before. What was going on there? I just think oh, the pro. I, I know I, that the probability is very nominal. I think that could have happened, but. You got to look at the, the Bill, things that did happen that Great day. chatting with you. Hey, I Nick, have to Next week, work on Bernie. Come yeah. back, Tom. Come back, Ural. Thank you, Bill. I will Thank work on it. I will be back. And I've scheduled with you, uh, Bill, as well. I finished all, all the yeah, thank you. paperwork. Hey, Ural. Yeah, yeah. I look forward uh, to I it. I know you don't yeah. have access, but I, I need to get a little clip to you so you can sign up. We'll get you a current on here on the show. So okay. Keep you updated. Hey, thank you, Tom. Okay. Yeah. We'll leave Ural on for a couple minutes. Um. You're old maestro. You're back up. We're recording you. So tell us what happened Wednesday again. A little more detail. Okay. So Wednesday, what happened was the police uh, did a raid on an apartment building in Saint Denis, which is a suburb just north of Paris. It started roughly about 4:16 in the morning and lasted about seven hours. Uh, they had thought at the time that there was um, three people in the apartment uh, that they were. Uh, trying to get into, they first used explosives uh, to blow up the the door to get the door open uh, to the building, and they wanted to do that to uh, have the element of surprise. Unfortunately, the door did not open well, and uh, so they lost the element of surprise because it was like a, it was one of these really strong reinforced doors. So uh, so it didn't open well. So that gave the uh, the uh, uh, the people inside the apartment plenty of time to start preparing and they started shooting back. And as it turned out, there was a lot more than three people involved. Um, uh, the end result of it was uh, five police officers being injured, uh, one police dog being killed, and uh, three of the uh, suspects uh, were also killed. Uh, one apparently was self-detonated. Now, the early reports, they thought there was a female suicide bomber. It turned out that that was not true. Um, so the only the only suicide bomber was a male. Really? Uh, there was yeah the wow. the female the female was blown up uh, because of the um, of the male suicide bomber who had uh, triggered and she she blew up in that explosion. 
which is interesting because it, it makes a little bit more sense because in the conversation between her and the police, there's a, there's a part where she says, help me, help me, which right. no, nobody could really uh, understand the context of that. But it, 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 who knows? It may be related to this guy blowing himself up. Um, so they found, uh, they found a third body later, which turned out to be a female body. And uh, so, uh, and then the, uh, the other person being killed, of course, was the ringleader himself who was, uh, who was uh, shot at. And then later there was an explosion. I mean, you know, there was a grenades being used as well. So, uh, so anyways, it was a very confusing event, but basically a long siege. Now they used a drone to, to uh, fly up to look into the window with a camera to try to get more information about what was going inside. Unfortunately, uh, it didn't really provide that much information. And then they used a couple of robots. They used a small robot to, um, well, they, they put in the police dog, um, but the, but the, but the uh, police dog was shot right away by the, the people inside. Uh, and then they sent in one of these little robots, but the robot ended up getting stuck in the um, debris and wasn't able to see too much. So then they sent in a bigger robot uh, and that bigger robot also got caught in the debris. So, um, so anyways, it turned out the two robots didn't help uh, as much as they were hoping. Um, what else happened that day that was of interest? So basically it was a long, very long siege. Later on, they went to a church because they were suspicious of the church. Um, and so they, uh, they entered into the church and that was it. That, that was, that was, that was, uh, was that Wednesday, I guess. So what are your forecasts for the weeks to come? I think, well, you know, um, I mentioned today that, you know, Brussels is still on high alert level four. Uh, the rest of Belgium is on level three. The prime minister gave a speech earlier today that he suspected that, um, there were, uh, potential, um, attacks going to occur in Brussels and Belgium. He said particularly commercial centers and other public areas were being targeted. Uh, NATO is going to open up tomorrow uh, with re reinforced security. The airport is um, is at a level three alert. Well, they have, a, uh, just to explain the alert system, they have a one to four alert system in Belgium. So four is the very highest and one is the lowest. So the city itself of Brussels, uh, uh, which is the European capital, is on a level four alert and outside of Brussels is on a level three alert. Um, so the air, so the airport is having, um, what do you call it? Increased reinforced uh, security measures, but, um, but it is operational and flights are, um, taking place. So very good. Hey, so what is art article five was not invoked by the French. What's going on with, I think it's Article Five that brings the rest of uh, NATO into the fight, and they did have the attacks too. Uh, the French went and hit targets, along with some well, Americans. What the French did, interestingly enough, for the first time ever, is they invoked the um, Article of the uh, Treaty of the uh, for the European Union, uh, which requires all member states to give uh, all uh, all assistance possible. Uh, to a state. So that's the first time that's ever been done. So basically um, uh, where France is going to be getting assistance from is from the other European states. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. So that's what they, the United States is not in on the fight right now per se. They are, but they aren't. We're, we're doing some, some work. Yeah. I mean, interestingly enough is Russia, Russia and France are, are really going mm -hmm. uh, 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 with full, full blown attack. So, Russia earlier this week um, destroyed 500, over 500 of those oil supply trucks in, uh, in East uh, Syria. Uh, they've also been hitting hard uh, Aleppo. Uh, they've been um, uh, using uh, cruise missile attacks. They took out 600 rebels uh, a couple days ago. So I reported about that. So, I mean, they've really been uh, uh, hitting, hitting hard. Uh, France has been hitting pretty hard. They hit, um, I think the other day we were talking, w w they had already hit the, the uh, 20 bombs on the day we, on the last, uh, our last broadcast, I think. Uh, and then they followed that up um, later in the week with, uh, with more bombs. And uh, they also had, um, they're sending out their aircraft, um, what do you call that? 
The carrier. Carrier, thank you. They have a carrier going in the Gulf. Sometimes I keep forgetting the words in English. Yeah, so they sent off an air, aircraft carrier, uh, the Charles de Gaulle, in, into the region. So that's going to be there, I think, on the uh, 25th, if I'm not mistaken. It's going to be there soon in any case, yeah. and it's going to be operation. And that's going to triple the um, uh, capability of uh, airplanes to, to strike there. Because they only have, they only have a, a total of 12 right now um, that are stationed in that area. How about the relationship between French, the French and the Russians right now? There's talk that they might well, join up. Oh yeah, they've they've been they've been. Uh, that's, that's what the talk have, is. Yeah, they've had a lot of cooperation. The uh, the um, uh, Putin has already instructed the uh, Russian Navy to cooperate with the French uh, forces. The they've also uh, the intelligence communities of uh, Russia and France have also started. Uh, increased cooperation. So there's been a lot of coordination going on between uh, uh, um, Russia and France, and that's really helped in the uh, military strikes uh, for for France in the region. Hey, I want to ask you some questions that are completely sort of off topic, and I don't know how much you hear about it, but how is two things? What is the opinion of the Parisians right now towards America, and has it evolved over the last couple of years? Um, well, that's really a difficult question for me to answer because uh, uh, it's not something I really take a pulse on. And I don't know yeah. that I've heard anything. Um, I don't know of anything um, that has changed recently uh, with that respect. Not to say that it didn't happen. It's just I'm not, I'm not I haven't heard anything. I'm not aware of any. I, I was uh, in bed. Any, I was in bed yeah. with the French and then I was in a brigade that they had a battalion assigned to. Um, oh, okay. In Afghanistan, and we had a very good relationship. How long ago was that? Uh, 2012, December, I left. So that almost oh, all okay. of 2012, I was with the French. Okay. So not too long ago. Okay. And uh, a forward operating base, 2nd Armored Battalion. And then they moved back, and they, when the president was elected, he vowed to get, you know, reduce the numbers in Afghanistan. So, uh, but they, and then they handled a hospital in uh, Kaya, which is a uh, hobble. Well, I mean, so, there was an in, there was an incident um, a few weeks ago. You might recall where there was a train that was coming from, uh, I think it was Amsterdam to Paris, and there was a, a terrorist on that that uh, yeah. uh, was fully armed and was, was going crazy. And there was some American um, military people off duty that were on the train, and uh, and they and and a couple of other. Uh, passengers actually were able to subdue the guy and get him tied right. up and stuff. Yeah. So there was, there was obviously a lot of appreciation for that. And those guys were awarded with um, right. French Legion of Honor medals. And uh, so it was a big ceremony. So I think there was a lot of appreciation for that. And, and, um, the, and the last thing I wanted to close on too uh, with you is um, we always do short term, long term forecast. Have you looked at our, yeah. pres- have you looked at our race for president over here? Yeah, a little bit. Sure. What are people thinking? Over here, yeah. I haven't I haven't heard a lot of people talking about it over here. To be honest, there was an article in the Economist, which is a, yeah. uh, a British magazine, which is really excellent, and they had a, uh, this was like, well, it must have been a month ago or maybe two months ago, but they had a, they had a whole full piece uh, leader on uh, um, on Trump, and uh, the Economist was. Uh, uh, very concerned <laughs> and they felt that uh, they felt that um, Trump was uh, totally inappropriate as a, as a presidential candidate. You know, it's interesting because, you know, the press here, since, it, since it's not, um, uh, since it's not our election, they can, they can talk very candidly about opinions about the candidates where, you know, the American press is, is always a little subdued, I guess, because they're worried about being biased or whatever. So, um, so the press here doesn't have any problem saying, you know, they think, uh, like the economist was saying, they think Trump is, is, is dangerous basically and, and out of his league. Um, when Palin was the vice presidential nominee, I mean, the press here had no problem saying like, she's totally uh, incompetent for the position um, and, and stuff like that, which uh, people in the States were very reluctant to say. Interesting to get outside perspective. Uh, I think G20 finished up and our president has been outside of the country and just come back in. So 
Yeah. But just to follow up on the question that was asked earlier, I think the amazing thing in the story is the role of the intelligence agencies and how good they've been at getting information and how quickly. Now, we haven't always acted on the information. So unfortunately, the Friday attacks, I mean, there's articles being written now about what was known and, and you know, the failure of uh, things of um, – other agencies to do something about it. But in any case, there was a lot of intelligence and especially Turkish intelligence and Moroccan intelligence uh, provided a lot of information to France about uh, the whereabouts of these people and, and when, and that's how they were able to, to um, track this guy down so quickly. That's, yeah, that's good. They, they did. And then in Belgium, they have the one suspect they're, they're trying to track down. That's about it right now. I, there's, I, maybe it's going to calm down for a while. Yeah, well, the the one suspect that they're trying to track down, um, what I didn't realize up until recently, I mean, we knew that he was stopped um, just prior to the uh, the Belgian border, um, but what I found out is they were actually stopped three different times. So there were three three different uh, times where they were pulled over by the police. Um, uh, the uh, the guy we're looking for, plus the two people that helped uh, drive him across. And uh, so now the, the two people that helped drive him across, of course, have been been uh, in custody and, and being interrogated, whereas uh, Saleh is still on uh, on the loose. Very good. Well, I think we're going to probably finish up with you this weekend. We hope come back next week. You're open anytime you want yeah. to come up. Come up. Come up early in the show. We start actually at nine thirty Pacific time. 9.30 p.m. Pacific time? No, a.m. Pacific. Oh, 9.30. Okay, so that's 18.30. Yeah, I, I got to come on early. I really like this show. And yeah, we, the last, to- last time you had a very um, interesting person on, too, as a guest. Yeah, we had a couple. It's hard to keep track. Uh, who was that? Do you well, I forgot, I forgot his name. It's like oh, King yeah, yeah, Cole, yeah, I know Cole or something like that. He's a DIA agent, a DIA, yeah. defense intelligence. Yeah. I tracked him down. I actually talked to him off the line. He's DIA. Yeah. yeah, it takes a lot of guts to be a DI, and I was rank and grade. Uh-huh. And, uh, if I was back in my old position, I wouldn't come on. But I, I'm happy he did. Yeah, I'm happy he did too. And um, and uh, yeah, so uh, it was interesting to hear his perspective on things. It, it is. And it's good to talk to him. Hey, Euro, if you get a chance, um, yeah, if you sort of remember Google timelines on iTunes. Uh, I do interviews one on one. It's about twenty five minutes. It goes up on uh-huh. timelines on a podcast, and it's about the person, what they do, where they came from, and what their okay, life, cool. life principles are. You're welcome to come on it. Um, okay, cool. It, you have to go on, um, if you can remember, podcastershome.com, and then uh-huh. it's hard to find the link to schedule, but um, I'm trying to think the well, easiest way. Well, well, let me ask you a question. What, what is your perspective of what's going on with the U.S. presidential election? We we do short term and long term uh, projections. First of all, my short my long term is that Hillary Clinton, who is under investigation for the FBI, will not uh, be the nominee for the Democrats. Now, wow, that's an that's an amazing that that prediction right there is pretty amazing. So let me ask you: if she's not the nominee, who is then? That's the big question. So I'd have to say right now, um, there's sort of an oligarchy where the elite have always selected or picked, and we talked about that. Meet the Press talked about this morning. And that, that uh-huh. those rules are being broken right now. Um, let me let me cite off a couple of things that were said um, in some research this week. One of the leading Republicans, um, leaders in the Republican Party right now in, in the developing the forums, he said that the rules aren't applying right now to normal candidates. The normal candidates he said would, would get him taken out of the election. Like exactly, the, the yeah. Polls, but they're not working on either side. And it's our feeling, too, that Bernie Sanders ha- is not being treated with fairness from the uh, national, from the uh, media agencies, that he actually has a lot more support than they're giving him credit for than Hillary does. Oh, yeah, of course. Hillary has like the old women and men support, but Bernie has the younger folks and even a lot of folks who are older who are socially connected and linked and is outdrawing numbers, much larger numbers than Hillary. Yeah, but what Bernie doesn't have is the establishment. He does not have establishment because he's so anti-establishment. So that's yeah. why it's a, it's it, it's like you said, it's very unfair. It's going to be an uphill battle for him. Yeah. But what I think is because because I, I thought about this too, this possibility that Hillary gets eliminated because of uh, um, the FBI, because of, yeah, the investigations. I mean, if she gets an indictment, 
it would seem very unlikely that she could survive that. It, it's really interesting though, just because the Clintons sort of have a have a history of like Teflon uh, <laughs> capability of surviving all kinds of like improbable. That's attacks. absolutely true. That's very true. Um, a little bit of my background. I had a high level security clearance. I worked uh, civil military operations in Afghanistan in the uh -huh. State Department of the Military. And I had a major in myself. We could call what we call bridge information. That means take uh -huh. some classified information, pull out the unclassified. It was very difficult oh, okay. to do. Well, it's known that classified material went onto her servers and it had been classified. So whoever bridged that information is going to go to jail. I mean, this is a very, very serious business. You don't want to mess around with classified. And the FBI, well, I mean, just the whole the whole idea of her having a private server sure. at her house to conduct business, business. as this as the Secretary of State. I mean, to me, is just mind boggling yeah. uh, that that would even be allowed, and then the fact that she had total physical control and, and management control and deleted so many thousands of emails. Because she she determined herself which emails right. were appropriate before uh, before they could be investigated, I think is 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 right. you know amazing. And of the emails um, that she didn't delete, that they they reviewed a high percentage of them now contain well relatively high percent contain yeah. classified material. Oh, what, so, one is too many. One is too many, and if there's yeah there's hundred, well, I think it's over hundred. Well, they did this. Yeah, they did a sample, and it was it was it was something like around ten percent last time I looked. Yes. So it was, it's pretty high. Um, and God only knows what was deleted. <laughs> yeah. hey, the other thing she did too is you'll hear FOIA, Freedom of Information Act. Yeah. And by doing what she did, she violated the spirit of the Freedom of Information Act. I mean, I sure. my emails which are not classified are still open to the public. Right. The, to some extent, there are probably some that they would go through and say this is absolutely not appropriate. It's about, you know, a family issue. Well, especially when there's an investigation going on, yeah. it's very questionable for her to be making determinations prior to the investigation. Yeah. She's, I, I, I just can't imagine why. I mean, this this is a, a filter of me going out and I'm a Republican. Yeah. I uh -huh. lean to, to the right. But uh -huh. in free markets and that sort of thing. But I try to stay neutral on this show as much as possible. But I just can't imagine how anyone would vote for her. With her, what she's done. The other thing too is I was actually on duty in a three-star headquarters on uh -huh. September 11th on 2012. So I got to watch live parts of what happened. Uh -huh. And I know for a fact that our, our, you know, she and the president lied for at least 10 days after the fact. Are you talking about the? Um, what are you talking about? Benghazi. Oh yeah. Well, she's already admitted that. I mean, yeah, there was I, mean, a, I, I watched. I was. I can't go into a lot of detail because I was in a. Uh huh. Yeah, I was working. Well, I was working for. I, I mean, I can say from what I heard. I mean, I was really shocked uh, at these hearings, and I'm surprised the media didn't play it up more. Is they have her communications uh, with a uh, uh, with a foreign leader where she point blank said that, uh, and this was like I think like the day after, or very shortly after, where she said point blank that it had absolutely nothing to do with the protest. And so, yeah. so she knew it. Yeah. And and she was very clear about it in her communications. So um, I, I saw obviously, a lot of the same intelligence that she they saw. We see, you know. Yeah. So so clearly um, yeah. her own words uh, convict her of. Um, yeah. Of at, at the very least uh, uh, hypocrisy on this issue. What, what uh, I will it, say it sounds more devious. The average voter in the United States and the older voter who support her, who are Democrats, I don't think understand the complexities of the issues. They know it's yeah, out right. there, but they just don't quite understand this email classified sort of situation. Yeah, I, I don't think you should be partisan on this issue because, I mean, the way I look at it is, uh, you know, she was, you know, it's unfortunate that Bernie went along with her in the debate and yeah, said, oh, you know, we're tired, tired of these emails. I was like, I don't think people understand how serious this email issue is. Yeah. Even, even if it wasn't, I mean... Even if it turned out that there, you know, we now know that there that there was a lot of uh, inappropriate information that was getting passed along. But even if it wasn't, just the fact that she had the server in her place, you know, she hired people from the State Department that she paid privately to 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 come there and to manage it. I was like, this this. I mean, I mean, how could you yeah. how, how how could you make it? You know, 
any more suspicious. <laughs> you know, it's just like crazy. Yeah, it's it's it'll be interesting to see. Like and I'm, again, that's my forecast that she will not get the nomination at the FBI, whether they can whether they bring charges or not. Hey, here's the thing to think yeah. about. Yeah. The president of the United States knows more than any of us on this situation, for the most part. He knows yeah. everything is happening. I'm sure he's up. Right. He's being briefed by the FBI. And uh, he knows what's going on. So, and Biden is not running. I mean, that's true. I thought Biden for sure would run. And then, Well, that's what I mean. If Hillary is out, I don't understand who the nominee is because it doesn't seem likely that it can be Bernie. Uh, now, normally, I would have said Biden, but then, of course, Biden kind of excluded himself. So I don't know if he could still come back in. I think so. I think uh, up to the convention. I mean, they can move votes around at the convention, especially if, if something happens. Uh, each state has some authority. Oh, so, so, you, so you think it might be Biden? I, I, my guess would be Biden and, and Sanders at the convention if something happens to her. But I'm not sure what the time frame but that's just my my forecast. My short term forecast is very difficult this week. It's Thanksgiving for us. Yeah. So everyone will be having a good Thanksgiving and not doing too Trump. Much. Trump's way ahead in the polls. Yeah. yeah. Surprising. What's his numbers now? I haven't really tracked them. Uh, it depends on which poll you're looking at. But you're talking about a good ten point lead now, oh, at wow. least over um, over uh, Carson. So uh, the Carson. one poll has Trump at twenty eight to eighteen. Yeah. Another one has him at thirty-two uh, percent. Um, so Carson thing. Carson keeps losing. This is the first time now he's below the 20, 20 percentage point. Mark. The other thing I've heard about Trump is his negatives are down. That's strange. You know, the negatives were what were going to get him. That means a lot of people would never. Oh yeah, him. yeah. Well, but his negatives are down after after the Paris attacks. Yeah, yeah. Because well, we he, talked about that in the show earlier today. We talked about yeah. the effect of the Paris attack on uh, American politics. Oh yeah, it's a it's a big win for a uh, Trump, and uh, Ann yeah. Coulter called it. Uh, you know, he he's he's seen as being uh, very tough. He's taken some very uh, uh, yeah. strong stands. I mean, he's he's already said now he's in favor of waterboarding. I haven't heard that uh, one yet. That's a first. But and oh, I've, been, yeah, yeah. I've been trying. If you go on our webpage, uh, yeah, meetthevoter dot com, we're trying to get first source on there. Okay. Everything. So we're trying to get you know exactly. The big controversial thing is that Trump said that he wanted to register all Muslims. Well, that's all yes. here. What, what what are the details of that? Are they the immigrants? I mean, and we look today at, you know, the process of becoming an American citizen and we don't ask about your religion. I, I don't I don't think technically. I mean, I, I'm not 100 percent sure that he actually said that he was in favor of um, of. Um, yeah, that's what I'm uh, saying. What's the first source? We're trying to find first source information. Because, because, because I heard, I heard that initially, and then the the, the newest reports I'm seeing saying uh, that he said he wouldn't rule it out, uh, which you know it's similar, but it's yeah. not the same thing. No, it's not the same. Uh, I think there's some twisted information out there, and we're trying to find first source. One first, yeah. One first source piece we did find is on September 11th, 214. Uh -huh. uh, the president of the United States said ISIS is not a state. Uh -huh. you no, know, I mean, he said it's not a state and whether right. you agree or not agree. It has the elements and functions of a state. You know, yeah, exactly. Afghanistan yeah. was a state under the Taliban and two countries recognized it. No, right. No, no one recognizes ISIS, of course, but it still has the right. functions of a state. The other right. thing he said, uh, ISIS, they're not Muslims. He said that they uh -huh. are not concerned. Well, if you look at social anthropology and what makes them tick, you know, it's a distorted view of the Muslim religion that makes them tick. You have to, right. you can't sort of put your head in the dirt in the sand and say there's not a distorted view. Now, we know that most Muslims are peaceful, law abiding citizens, especially in the United States and, and in France for that case, too, where you have close to 10 percent Muslim population. Yeah. The, the president of the United States, I mean, the, you know, I mean, he's doing this, obviously, for a clear reason. So he wants he wants to say that they're not Muslim because he wants to make it clear yeah. uh, that the United States is not fighting a war against Muslims. Right. Against we're not. We're not. Because yeah. I was like I was with the Jordanians and better work support the Jordanians right. in Afghanistan. We have many allies. We fought alongside the Afghan people. Yeah. So so that that's why he's saying that. So, I mean, it, it, yeah. it's kind of. Um, we, I think they should define even well, Gates, who, you know, Gates was. Uh, Secretary of, uh, Secretary of State, and CIA. Gates, though, says that you define an extreme, they're extremists, they're extremists, but they're of the Muslim base. They're motivated by an extreme view of the Muslim, Muslim religion. 
Yeah, we don't have see we don't have this problem at all in France. What, 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 uh, how do you describe your, it? Because we have we have two different words for it, so so people are very clear. So we call it Islamism. Okay. Okay. So so we say Islamicist and is, Islamism. Uh, that is the the people like ISIS that have this extreme okay. form of that, and we call the other people Muslims. That's good. I like so, that. So uh, so that. so uh, France is very clear. We're we're at war with uh, Islamicists and with yeah. uh, Islamism, which we won't accept. And uh, or, How do you or say it some French? people, you say same, the same way. way. Yeah, huh? we say the same way. Okay. And uh, uh, and the thing that um, you know, some people in the states, like particularly the Republican Party, are saying radical Islam. So they're making they're making a distinction. We, some people, we've used that. Some as people Republican. say. Yeah. Some people say uh, I hear like um, Islamic. Uh, what do you say, Islam of fascism or something like that? So well, um, early on we called it the war of terror. I mean, war a war on um, war on terror. In fact, I've got medals from the war on terror. And then Obama took that name out. Yeah, when he became president. It was no longer a war on terror. We're, 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 the global war on terror was the name of the campaign. So what's it called now? You know, I, I'm not current. I left in 212. Oh, okay. I, I should well, know better. I mean, it's not even, I don't think they consider it wars anymore. No, I, I mean, he, he's got a difficult position because on the one hand, he doesn't want to make it sound like the United States is at war with all of Islam. Because no, you, we don't. You don't want to fight a war with 1.6 billion people. But, uh, but, uh, but he shouldn't shy away from the religious aspect of this because, as you pointed mm-hmm. out, these people are fighting a religious war. So it, it's definitely a form of yeah. Islam. Uh, it's and, a caliphate, if you understand yeah, the caliphate. Yeah, exactly. It's a caliphate. It's definitely a form of Islam. And uh, uh, fortunately, um, you know, there's, uh, it's not followed by all Muslims, but there are some Muslims that, that ascribe to it. And, uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a cancer on the, the it, world it, politics. Euro, let me read off um, a list that we came up with that why, um, why the American population is fed up with politics and the inside element. Okay. And they came up over the last 20 years, they came up with these issues, sex scandals, financial scandals, two unwon unwon wars, two unwon wars, really neither war was one economic meltdown in 2008 with a tempered recovery. Five is not even pretending to control our borders, both Republicans and Democrat um, elected. Number six is loss of trust, confidence in corporations, banks, and in some cases, churches. And number seven is unhappy and uh, unhappy times in our country. And that's sort of a sentiment with a lot of people. It's not like the Reagan era. It's a uh, it's a different era right now. Uh, it's a different era right now. So did you yeah. hear some of those? You catch those? Yeah, I, I guess I I don't, I don't quite understand what the, what is that a list of? That's a list of. Um, that was put out by members of Meet the Press on a special edition. Yeah. And the person who was on the panel was Frank uh, Frankenhoff, which is a a well known Republican um, leader at the national level. And he's yeah. saying that he's saying that the uh, like Trump normally when you'd say something like Trump would say he'd be wiped out, wouldn't be in the poll, wouldn't be in the election at all. Right. But he's saying things that you know are breaking all the traditional rules of the centrist, not you know. Yeah, well, Trump, Trump, you know, Trump, Trump is probably the most interesting candidate that we've had in a very long time. So, uh, so it's not too surprising to me that he's doing so well, only because, uh, you know, he makes the Republican primary interesting. Without him, it definitely it, does. It'd yeah. be, be very boring. Um, he does say some really um, outlandish things that would normally get a candidate in a lot of trouble, but. I think the reason, one of the reasons, at least, if not the primary reason why he's doing so well, is the uh, refreshing honesty and clarity. I mean, he doesn't, you know, he he doesn't go, uh, you know, he's not concerned about political correctness. Correctness. <laughs> no, he he says sure. things. He says things very bluntly. You know, he says things that that, that people are, are afraid to say, and. Um, there's a lot of truth to a lot of the things that he says, you know. So I think it, it's uh, for a lot of people, it's a very, uh, it's a refreshing change. It's an interesting change. Um, but when you start talking about things about, um, you know, keeping files on, on uh, all Muslims or um, surveilling mosques and stuff like this, right. 
obviously, you know, it causes some concerns from some people about uh, civil liberties and stuff. And he talks about bringing back waterboarding and all this. Type in, of stuff. Inside the United States, we don't do those things. I mean, and that's the FBI's job to run down the criminals, not the CIA. But ironically, outside the United States, strange things do happen. I can't go to lie. Well, I mean, I mean, by different agencies, whatever you know, whatever. I mean, I mean, I mean even mean, the French outside of the France do some strange things. The United States does strange stuff. They don't have the same requirements to live under as they do inside our country. Wait, oh, you're talking about you're talking about American intelligence agencies yeah. outside the country, outside oh, the United States. Oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. I mean, I, I don't want to go to the details because I know know about some of it, but uh, yeah. I'll just say that there's a lot of cooperation. Right. with some of the allies and by using those uh resources they're able to do things that they wouldn't necessarily be able they, to they, do domestically they share intelligence and you know sometimes yeah. outside sources find intelligence on american citizens and they pass that to the agencies from outside the oh yeah States. absolutely absolutely i mean it's they, really well, strange i mean it's a strange well, they, it's they a actually world. especially the united states i mean they actually have joint operator facilities with some of these countries so they're basically <laughs> they're there you know what i mean it's like yeah, fusion you know, centers outside the U.S. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. so a lot of information is 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 gained that way. But plus, also, you know, post post nine eleven, um, there was a lot of um, a relaxation of certain restrictions, and there was all kinds of activities going right. on um, um, that was authorized uh, that involved all kinds of um, surveillance and information gathering it's definitely strange well jonathan what's your opinion of the algerian population that lives in france what do you think the majority of um algerian muslims think of what what of isis and what's happening in the middle east well i think i think it's a really good question i i i don't have any um survey numbers or percentages um I suspect, um, like anywhere else, pro- I, I suspect most Muslims are probably against it. But that's not to say that there aren't sympathizers, and there, you know, and there are significant numbers. I mean, most of the uh, political correctness of our media is doesn't want to talk about this, but there are sympathizers. And there was a case, for instance, in the south of France, where there was a history teacher that was stabbed uh, by three of ISIS sympathizers who rode up uh, on scooters. And one was wearing an ISIS T-shirt. The other was had a uh, a photograph of uh, uh, a previous terrorist in in uh, in France that had killed several people. And uh, you know, and they they rode up in in broad daylight and started attacking uh, this teacher and stabbing him and had all kinds of threats and insults. And fortunately, a car pulled up and interrupted them, uh, so the person was only stabbed. But um, and is, is at least alive. But um, that just goes to show you, um, you know, that, that, that there are sympathizers and that they, they, you know, and, and even the people in this apartment building in the siege shows you that, you know, they're, 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 just the raids this 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 last week. Right. We've we've had um, hundreds of raids and they've uh, they've arrested scores of people. Uh, they they've uncovered. Um, tons of um, unauthorized weapons, including weapons of war. I think 18 weapons of war, um, quarter million dollars of narcotics. I mean, so there's clearly a network of sympathizers, and it's uh, you know it's dangerous. So as soon as I get up over 17, I'll uh, back off. You can bring up over 17. Those are good numbers. But I want to thank everyone for listening. I want to thank those who participated. We had 592 people as of right now, uh, tune in today. We have 34 to 50 on at any one time in the last couple hours. We had Euromeister from uh, overseas, and we had our panel. We're uh, trying to get on some politicians. Bernie Sanders would probably be our first choice right now. He's got an open invitation. And on Sundays, it's great. If you're not participating, you can go ahead and listen to meetthevoter.com. And again, we thank all of those for participating.